So the first thing is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, I have one extra thing to add to the agenda, which is um, was suggested to me uh, that we put uh, an item on to nominate a representative to the uh, school resource officer committee um, from the council. And uh, so we'll do that um, towards the end, since that's going to be one of us, uh, I think we can probably put it on um, just before the council reports. So that'll be item 16 or so, or 16 and a half. Um, and besides that, I just want to note that, uh, super interesting, we're going to do the appointments before we do the consent agenda. And I think that's great. So uh, anyway, it's just a little bit different than our normal order, but fair enough. Uh, I think that's it. Any other suggestions or comments about the agenda? Ooh, me, me. I have some. <laughs> okay, go ahead, John and then Donna. Okay. The, I don't know why this always happens. The liquor licenses trickle in over the year now because of COVID, but they always come in before I can get them on the agenda. It's very frustrating. Or after I'm just getting them on the agenda. Sorry. So we've got uh, first and third class and outside consumption licenses for approval from Nutty Steps and the third class license to approve from Positive Pi. Okay, and that's on the consent agenda? Uh, yeah. That's or, right. or you're suggesting that we add it to the consent agenda? Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Um, Donna. Well, actually, I want to comment on John's because it was on my list to ask, what can we do or do we have any empowerment to influence when license, liquor license are due, when we sign them, it just seems people are really lax and they get away with it. And no. I wonder if, there, if there's any clear deadline so that we can group them better. There is a clear deadline and that's why historically they've come in over just a few weeks. I mean, historically in the past, really two months. Uh, it's, it's April 30th is the deadline. But the thing is that was post COVID. So they've been given a whole lot of slack and a whole lot of room for short term for not needing to to um, you know renew in the normal time, and because of that they've been trickling in. But usually you all start seeing them uh, late January or February really, and then they stop cold um, at the end of April, and uh, then you don't see them again until the next year. So it's an unusual year just for that. As far as whether can we alter the uh, deadline? No, that's DLC, that's state, we're stuck with that. But usually it's more organized. And I, I'm hoping it'll get back to that next year. Yes, okay, thank you. It helps me understand it better. And I wanted to just echo what Ann said about having the appointments early in the agenda. That's so much more considerate to potential candidates. So thank you. Who ever thought of that? Cameron, Bill, whoever, thank you. Possibly Mary. Mary? <laughs> we'll, we'll take full credit. We think it was a mistake, but we'll uh, <laughs> take and, um, Yeah, Mary was right on top of that. That's right. <laughs> Yay, Mary. <laughs> OK. Uh, any other comments about the agenda? OK, so we will um, consider the agenda approved without Objection. So the first item then is appointments to the Historic Preservation Committee. Um, to that, it looks Mayor? like we have five. Mayor? Sorry. Yeah. Yes. You have general business before those. Oh my goodness! I'm just getting ahead of myself. Okay. Thank you. General business and appearances. So this is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. And so if you um, want to address the council uh, during this time or later, if it is pertinent to a different topic, if you would uh, say your name and you, where you live and uh, try to keep your comments to about two minutes um, or less, that would be fabulous. Um, so having said that, is there anyone who would like to address the council uh, on a topic otherwise not on our agenda? Feel free to either physically raise your hands or um, use the raise hand function. And 
Cameron, are you seeing anyone? Oh, ma'am. Okay. Um, all right, so we are going to continue then. So now we're up to the uh, appointments to the Historic Preservation Committee. Uh, and I believe there were five vacancies and uh, three folks who applied. And I thought I saw at least um, one of those folks on. Eric Gilbertson is here. Yes, uh, Eric, would you like to uh, address the council? And I, I know you've been on this committee, but uh, tell us about your. Um, well, we're yeah, so introduce us yourselves and tell us about your interest in. in we're we're, we're also pleased and thank the council for getting the new design review rules done. And I think the, the next step is really providing a set of materials to the public to help them through uh, whatever issues they have with design review. And I just want to continue that. Great, fabulous. Um, and then I also see that uh, Ru uh, Robert McCullough is here. Uh, would you like to also uh, introduce yourself and, and tell us about your interest in this committee? Oh, but I think you might be muted. Okay, is that working now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes I've been on the, the commission for two years now, three years, and simply want to continue doing what I've been doing. Um, I'm also a former member of the Design Review Committee, and I, I, it's time for me to get back involved with, with uh, the city and its uh, efforts to preserve historic resources. So. Great. Thank you. And I'm not sure if I see uh, Brian Powell on the call, but if you are here, if you would uh, unmute yourself and um, let us know. Okay, um, and so addressing the council, do you have any questions for either Eric or Rob? Okay, uh, so is there, actually maybe um, what we can do is continue on to the other committees as well. Uh, and then we can make the appointments all at the same time, if that's agreeable to you. Uh, Donna, go ahead. It's very agreeable, but since you're gonna move on, I just wanted to thank both Robert and Eric for your, your time served. It, your expertise applied to the city is much appreciated. Thank you for being willing to renew. Thanks, Donna. Thank you. <laughs> yes, agreed. Uh, okay. Um, I didn't see Ben Cheney on, but I could be wrong. Ben, are you here? Okay, uh, there were two seats uh, open on the Design Review Committee, and I think it's just Ben um, who is uh, reapplying there. Uh, and then the Hazard Mitigation Committee that is not totally clear to me how many seats um, li recommend limiting the number of folks who can participate. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm not sure how many seats we are aiming for in that committee, but we have one uh, person who has applied. Um, Donna, do you have someone? If you would like. So, Go ahead, Cameron. I, I apologize. Um, so we have uh, been asked to create the hazard mitigation plan committee. So what they'll do is they'll help us look at what um, hazards they believe are in our um, community to make sure that we're um, sort of capturing that from all different angles um, and different perspectives. It helps us uh, increase our flood, um, uh, I'm sorry, insurance payments back to us. We get some discounts off of that. There is no limit to this. Uh, we'd like that committee to sort of be sanctioned by y'all and then uh, we can start advertising a little more, but we'd really like to get that kicked off. Okay. And we have one person who has applied for that. Um, uh, Vic 
Victoria Arthur. Is Victoria on? Okay. Um, so, Council, is there a motion? Go ahead, Dan. One question, one question before a motion. Um, on the design review, Ben Cheney had applied to be reappointed, but I noticed he was an alternate. Um, and there's two positions open. One is his alternate position, and one is a sort of full board member position on the design review committee. Um, I, I'll just simply ask, since he's not here, if anyone has heard as to a, a preference, um, because absent a preference, I, I would actually think it would make sense, given his length of service on there, to bump him up from an alternate to a full board member um, instead. That's a good question. Donna? Uh, I agree with you, Dan. I think we should do it. He's not here. And he can always let us know, and we have to do a, a kind of different appointment for him. But right. I, I think it would be great to put him on as a full member. Okay. It's, it's that danger of not attending a meeting and getting appointed to a committee. <laughs> <laughs> I'm checking on that now while we speak. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh I'll make a motion. I'll be happy to make a motion for if if Jack's checking on that. I'll I'll make a motion for the uh, other appointments, which is which um, would be to reappoint Robert McCullough and Eric Gilbertson to the Historic Preservation Committee, and to appoint Victoria Arthur to the Hazard Mitigation Plan Committee. And there's a third person for the Historic Preservation too, Mr. Powell. Oh, sorry. Uh, and and I'll amend my motion to include uh, Brian Powell um, to be reappointed to the Historic Preservation Committee as well. And I would ask you to add Ben Cheney to the design review. I mean. Yeah, Jack, did you hear him? Not yet. Um, <clears throat> so I, I think we just go ahead. Okay, so I, I'll add to that motion uh, to appoint Ben Cheney to a full position on the Design Review Committee. And I'll second it. Okay, and Lauren. I was just a little unclear from Cameron. Do we have to actually create that Hazard Mitigation Committee before we appoint people to it, or is just the act of appointing someone to a committee essentially creating it? Um, I leave that to you. you um, no, it does not currently exist. If you speak it into existence, that works for me. Maybe we could amend the motion to say we hereby create and appoint Victoria Arthur to the whatever it's called. That's what you meant, Dan, right? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, <laughs> I, I think existentially speaking, we're we're in a matter of not having an a priori committee, so um, it comes into being by virtue of its existence. <laughs> English, English. <laughs> Existence precedes uh, essence. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so there's been a motion and a second. Um, is there any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, and opposed. Okay, um, thank you, uh, Eric and Robert, again for your for your service. We're so grateful. And thank, and you. thank you. Yeah. Yes, All right. Well, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you very much. Uh, right now. And thanks, thanks for pushing it up on the agenda. That was very considerate. Yeah, no problem. That too. Thank you. All right. Uh, so we are up to the consent agenda. Uh, at this point, and uh, with uh, the extra, potentially with the extra liquor licenses that John Odom uh, mentioned, uh, is there a motion? Uh, Donna. Well, I would like to pull item A for discussion okay. from the consent agenda. And I'm sorry I didn't give you advance notice. That's okay. Um, is there a motion regarding the rest of the consent agenda minus A? 
I move that we approve the consent agenda as amended. I'll second. And that that does not include item A, is that correct, Jack? Correct. That's what I, I was taking that as one of the amendments. Okay. Great. All right, there's been a motion and a second. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, that uh, the rest of the consent agenda passes. One question um, would be, do we take up item A now or do we take it up later? Um, Donna, is it a quick question or do you think it's going to No, take I have like four parts, so yeah, it's not a quick question. Okay, so um, maybe that's something we can hold to the end. Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Fine. So I'm just going to make a note to myself that we revisit that uh, probably before um, we or yeah, before we do the um, nomination to the SRO committee. Okay, uh, so just taking a quick look here. Um, wondering how many folks are on for the uh, finances versus the winter parking ban. Um, I sort of feel like we should do the winter parking ban first and then go right into the budget. I do want to do the budget while we are still fresh, um, but I do you know there's some folks on the call for um, the, uh, the winter parking discussion. So if it's okay with everyone, I'm going to um, move the parking discussion to next and then we'll go into the budget or the finances and whatnot. Um, <laughs> okay, so from there, uh, so this is, I'm going to officially open the public hearing. This is the second public hearing on, um, on an adjustment to the uh, winter parking um, regulations. And so for this, I'm going to turn it over to Zach and Donna. Well, good evening. Oh, sorry. sorry. Good evening. Good evening. We're working on this. Okay, um, so uh, Zach's here with me, but I'm going to take uh, the first part of this and recap what's happened um, since our last conversation. Uh, the best news that I have is that we really have received no comments. That isn't just no negative comments. Um, we have received a few positive um, conversations, but for the most part, no one has offered any um, conversations that indicate that people are upset or they, um, you know, would like to remain in the way it's been. Um, we have answered a few questions to clarify things and all of those um, answers have been received well. Um, in addition to that, we um, have created a sample sign to show you. It's kind of hard to do um, up and down here, but um, so these are the signs. We're working on them. They're color coded. They will be color coded. So even in odd days, we'll be in different colors. Um, they will um, be installed on all the streets so that um, the neighborhoods know what is happening if this goes forward. Um, it, it meets all the sign conventions that we're held accountable to. Um, and uh, so that is um, one example of work that will be used in the future to keep um, people understanding what's supposed to be happening on every street. Um, we've added tables uh, to the information that's been posted on the city's website so that people can find their way there. They can find also um, a map of the entire area and it indicates um, the different scenarios and they can look up their street and their number and understand what might be um, the situation for them. Um, we have, um, as I mentioned, a map for public viewing on the city's website um, um, that is very detailed. We've developed a winter parking flyer. Um, I'm gonna show you this here. 
We emailed it to all of you uh, city councilors um, late this afternoon. I spoke with all the downtown merchants or the majority of them who were open um, during the day that we were uh, knocking on doors. Many of them, even those who don't typically post um, general information, agreed to post it so that anybody coming into their store or business would have some awareness of what's happening um, in terms of conversation for tonight. Um, the one, um, I guess the um, specifically the questions from residents came um, about for three different streets only, Lower Elm Street, Berry Street, and Court Street. Um, and each of those have um, unique aspects um, regarding parking. So that wasn't, um, that wasn't a surprise to us that we heard from those folks. Um, let's see. Um, the one, anything else that I'm missing, Zach? Okay. Um, so I think we've been doing a really good job. We have contacted the CAN neighborhoods. We've um, sent information to the schools. Um, we haven't um, had any additional distribution um, through those venues yet, but we'll be working with schools and the CAN neighborhood um, once a decision is made. Um, the um, parking signs will all, I'm sorry, I misspoke earlier. Um, thanks, Zach. Um, the, in order to be in compliance with the standards for sign, um, we will have to have all the signs be um, done in green. We had originally thought we'd do uh, one side in blue and the other side in green. So my mistake, I didn't realize we had to be held to that standard. Um, so I am not seeing in my notes any other um, situations that we wanted to share with you before we get into the details here. And now I'm going to turn this over to Zach. Turn mine all the way up. Good. All right. Um, so, uh, just to reiterate on what Donna was saying, we did look at trying to make the signs uh, green and blue um, with the information, uh, with the according information of each of the signs, um, but it's not. The options were red, uh, which is a, um, a per, uh, prohibited action, or green, which is permitted. Uh, so, um, we had we decided to go with the green sign because it was more intuitive, um, having a positive type of comment and the affirmative and rather than a negative comment. Uh, no parking here versus parking is allowed here. Um, so we went back and forth for a while and that was the sign that uh, we ended up with and um, we feel that it's fairly clear, uh, simple. Uh, we did change the, I think the last time we spoke we had um, from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m as the, the window um, at which they could begin switching over. We bumped that back to midnight again so that it was easier uh, to get that uh, point across to people. Um, we were having a hard time with how do you switch over the night of, on a sign and make it clear for everyone. Um, so we, we tried to simplify it a little bit uh, on, on that side. Um, I think the one other biggest change uh, that we presented from um, the first reading till now is that in the downtown district, we have proposed um, no parking um, after the hours of midnight. So from midnight till 7 a.m., um, we're proposing no parking uh, during that time frame, which will align with our work crews being able to get in there and clear uh, the streets uh, prior to the beginning, prior to commuters coming back into the downtown uh, zone. Um, we, I do want to mention that we added a table five, which is unclassified, um, but it's really, right now it's completely empty, uh, but it's there so that if we have specific anomalies that we need to address, uh, that we 
can can do that accordingly. We can take it and put it from one of the tables and put it into uh, that other table. Um, I guess with that being said, I will open it up for any questions. And if you guys need to want to look at the map or whatever you guys want, then we can discuss. Uh, so just to just to no, I'm echoing. Um, can I ask you about that table five, the unclassified thing? Like, what's an example of the kind of street, not, not street specifically, but the kind of situation that might oh, kick something to that table? Yeah, the one that uh, comes like foremost to the front of my mind is Elm Street between Court and Spring. Right now, we we went forward and we put that as odd only. So on odd days, they'll be able to park in that section. On even days, they would have to find a nearby uh, parking, um, which is uh, on court, court and Elm are reciprocating days. So based on the counts that we did, it, we should have plenty of ability to offset both of those. Um, but w I do anticipate that there may, we may get some questions about um, being able to provide parking for those units right along the street there. Um, yeah. But I do want to uh, explain to everyone that that section of street is one of the most difficult sections for us. Uh, we can never really clear it because people are always parked there. Um, so it's, it's one of these things that we've tried to accommodate um, both ends, uh, both operational and the residents. Uh, but, you know, if it if it is a problem, we have the ability to address it in kind of a, a different manner. Um, another instance may be over by on Loom Street, over by the schools. Um, I think that part of the school's proposal was giving two spots to um, residents. So we may need to do something a little bit different there. Um, and that's really why that table is created. Um, everything that can't be captured and we tried to group everything into the four other categories as much as possible. Um, and then if we need to address them in a different manner, we can. Um, so just to um, I have a couple other questions. Um, so one is how many tickets roughly um, would you say the city ended up issuing last year? If you had to ballpark it, I I can't even guess on that one. And I would have to ask um, PD about their actual amount of tickets. I mean, it's possible that Cameron might know um, because she dealt with more of the uh, the complaints and whether or not she was going to. Do you have any idea about the amount of tickets? I don't. I only heard from the folks who were contesting theirs. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I apologize. We'll get that data for you. Okay. That would be, I think it would be good to know. And, um, but it would be safe to say that it is substantial. Yeah. Okay. And um, especially in areas where we have problems, I, we deal with a lot of tickets and a lot of, um, you know, reoccurring repeat offenders um, trying to actually change the behavior has been quite difficult. Um, okay, um, I have some other questions, but I'm going to hang on to them for now. Um, I think there were some other hands that were interested in going up. Um, I see uh, Dan and then Jack and then um, Heather, did you want to, um, did you have comments or questions? Okay, so we'll go Dan, Jack, and then Heather. Sure. Um, I have a couple of questions, but really the, the first one on the signs, will there be any signs for the streets where parking's only allowed on one side. Um, you know, so like on Liberty Street, for example, I, I know that, you know, uh, from basically Main Street until St. Paul, you're only allowed to park on the odd side normally and there's no parking signs, but how, how will people, how will, will there be any signage to indicate for those streets where you're, you're implementing that that may not have no parking signs already existing or mm -hmm. not have them? So the signs will be placed where parking is, is allowed. So like on Liberty Street, the parking is kind of staggered. So that first piece that you're talking about, you're allowed to park um, a few spots on the one side of the road. I believe it's the odd side of the road. Um, and then the even section doesn't start till a little bit further down. Um, so the sign would begin 
on both sides of the street um, where you're allowed to park. So on the odd side, we would, the sign would be placed where you can begin parking. And then on the even side, it, um, it'll be the same. Um, so it'll be signed where you're allowed to start parking. Uh, and the tables, the reason why we didn't list each street as an alternating is because not every street starts and stops at the same spot, which is why we separated the two tables out to even parking zones and odd parking zones instead of alternating parking streets uh, because it was getting too difficult to make it clean and clear about where you start and stop each of those zones. So just so I understand, so then basically if someone's parking on going to park on a street, they would look for one of these signs that would indicate that they could park there yes. based on the calendar day. And if there wasn't a sign there, it would indicate that they couldn't park in that particular area. Correct. Um, and so the one thing that we may need to have that I haven't, I hadn't quite wrapped my head around is that we may need to have an end, you know, end uh, even parking zone, right? End of parking here. Right. Uh, and no parking beyond this point. So on Liberty Street, uh, on the one side, it is no parking from, there's no parking sign where you can't park. Um, right. So we may need to add a second sign to that and that says like end odd parking here or some, of some sorts. Okay. Okay, uh, Jack and then Heather and then is that Bill? Yeah, okay, so and so Bill will be after Heather. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I don't know what, what it says about me that uh, when Donna was describing these different color signs, my first thought was, hmm, does that comply with the manual on uniform traffic control, control devices? But uh, following up on what uh, Dan said, um, I'm just wondering about what the most uh, intuitive sign distribution is, especially for someone who's not familiar with the area. Usually if you if you come to a street and you're looking for a place to park and you uh, you look for the signs on the side of the street where you're looking to park. And if it doesn't if you don't find a sign that says no parking, you're you can assume you probably are allowed to park there. Now this is kind of doing the opposite. And so I'm just wondering if this is the best way to do it and if it's likely to be more confusing to, uh, to drivers. I think this probably isn't in the ordinance itself, but I do think it, it might be worth uh, more consideration. I don't know what you think about that. So the plan is um, to really put them at every intersection. So you say you're coming down Liberty Street, you turn, take a right off of Main Street onto Liberty, um, you would have odd side parking begins here and you, you're traveling down towards Loomis, you'd hit St. Paul Street, and then you'd have another sign at the intersection of, right after the intersection of St. Paul to, so that if a, if a motorist turned right onto Liberty Street, that they would know that they could park in that zone again. Um, so it's going to be a lot of signage um, as there's quite a bit of signage out there now. Um, so some signs will be taken down and new ones will have to be put up. Um, but that is one example that at intersections, we will have to have signs so that people know um, because if they, if they get onto the street mid block, there's no way for them to determine whether or not they're, or they're allowed to park there. Okay. Um, the the second question that occurred to me related to that uh, that block on Elm Street between Court and Spring Street. Um, I know from representing people who live in those uh, in those apartments that there's uh, and just from observation that there are probably seems like there's a higher number than usual of of people with disabilities who probably park with uh, handicapped parking uh, tags and uh, one is just it, it may be a hardship for them to park on court street and uh, and walk down or use a use a wheelchair or a scooter to get down 
but two is um, will does their uh, handicapped parking tag allow them to park on a space like that where we we've, we've told them it's prohibited because of uh, the side of the street. I wouldn't think that a handicapped parking tag would allow you to park in a prohibited zone. Um, but the reason why I, I mentioned Elm Street was because it's one of the ones that we may have to kind of have a different plan around. Um, I just, you know, I looked at trying to fit, trying to stagger alternating zones, um, but there's the yellow line. So you'd have to take away the yellow line in order to really shift uh, cars there. Um, one other thought is that maybe we have um, reached out to the people that are in that that block in that unit and try to come up with a different game plan for maintenance. Um, the way that it's always been hasn't worked, so we need to do something different. Um, and that's this is why we have that table um, because I assume that there's going that there may be a few of these anomalies that we need to kind of address outside of um, all of the other streets. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, Heather. Hi, this is Heather Corey. Um, I still think this is a, a really good plan for the city. I think snow removal is really important and I think it gives some um, flex more flexibility for residents. Um, Zach, I was looking at the tables and at the last meeting you mentioned that Upper Sibley between College and Sabin would open up on the odd days, but I didn't see it listed on the table. Hold on one second. I do have the tables printed in front of me, so just give me one minute. During this lull, can this is Steve Whitaker? Can I ask what page in the packet the maps are included in tonight's packet? Uh, the map is on the city website, Steve. Um, I don't believe that it was included in the packet. Um, also, Zach, maybe while you're looking at that, maybe um, unless you're unless you're right there, I was gonna say maybe Bill can ask his question. So, um, okay. Heather, I think that there is an, an error in the table, which we will correct. Um, we did tell you last time that it, it would be um, even parking from Barry, uh, on Sibley Ave between Barry Street and Sabin Street and odd parking between College Street and Sabin Street. Um, I'm not exactly sure why that's not correctly reflected in the table here, but we would make that change. Uh, and the, the only other comment I was going to make was, didn't last year, wasn't there like, um, you know, one of the lit written signs on the corner of Maine and um, 302 that stated winter parking ban was happening? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm thinking of Burlington, but that might be another thought just to give... Um, people from out of town a heads up that um, pay attention to the signs on the street? Just so last year we had two of uh, those signs. We rented one and we owned one um, and they basically stayed out and when we needed to issue a winter parking ban, it would be turned on. Um, this year, we don't really have a, a designated use for them. Um, so we, we could deploy them and um, help you know, message, message that accordingly. Um, the location at which we used to uh, put the sign, though, um, is going to compete with the wayfinding sign, so we might have to find a new location for it, but we'll worry about that. Okay, thank you. Um, so, Bill, and then I think I saw a hand from Jay. Hi. 
Um, I, I, don't, I don't know that I heard uh, or understood quite clearly the, what's happening in the downtown. If you could go over that again. Um, okay, so in the downtown, um, and that includes State Street uh, beginning at Barry Street, uh, sorry, Main Street beginning at Barry to uh, number 137, School Street, uh, a portion of Elm Street from Langdon to Court, State Street, Langdon, and East State Street, basically everywhere there's a parking meter. Um, we will allow parking on both sides of the street. On East State Street, uh, where there's only meters on one side of the road, it, you'll be allowed to park in that zone every day, regardless of the calendar day. So basically, in the downtown, you're allowed to park as is until midnight, at which point um, we, we ask that cars be off the street. Uh, so that... Um... I wonder how that works because there are still businesses open at midnight, right? I, I, I think that there are, there are bars open, right? So I, I think about two implications that you have people who are um, not, haven't left there. I, I assume the intention is if you want to keep people from leaving their car there overnight. Um, and so I would, I would, I would I would think that it might make sense to wait until I don't know a half hour after all the establishments are closed to make that, and then I would also I, I look at the unintended consequences of forcing people to drive after they've been sitting in a bar all night. I do sometimes go through the town early in in the morning and you see cars um, that have been there and you think oh that was probably a good choice you know um, so. I don't know how you want to deal with that, but I, I do think about uh, that when I think about what happens in our downtown and and I and I completely understand the need to clear it out too. So uh, that's all that struck me on that. Well, thank you for that comment. And it's something that, uh, to be very honest and frank with you, it's something that we struggled with in terms of um, going one way or another on. Um, we had to when um, I, talk, I spoke with Donna earlier this week, um, who had a conversation with uh, Bill, and they, what we were told is just, we need to put something forward, and we need to see, um, we need to get a gauge on whether, how that will work. Um, so we had a discussion operationally, we looked at the parking counts overnight, and this is what we decided to move forward with. The other option in the downtown would be to move to an alternating uh, format as we are doing throughout the rest of the city between the hours of 12 and 7 a.m. Um, not as good from an operational standpoint, uh, but I can understand if that is the direction that um, we wish to proceed. Bill, a couple of thoughts on that too. Um, one is, you know, that's it's an impact on the nights that there's real storm, right? The nights that the plows aren't coming out you know, it's less of an urgency. I mean, they're supposed to move at midnight, but presumably we can talk about how we're enforcing that. And the second thing is in uh, the last couple of years, we've had winter parking bans, which took effect at one. Now it is an hour later, but it was the same deal. I mean, some of the bars were open at two. And at one, you know, that's when it was tow time for us to, to come out. So it's on snow nights. It is a, an issue we've had to deal with. And I, I don't know what the solution is. I suppose if someone leaves a car there and gets it plowed in, but then, you know, that's not helping pedestrians and everybody else. So I, I, it's a great, we, we don't know the total right answer on this one. Yeah. Good question. Um, Jay. Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple things. First, um, uh, I appreciate appreciated Heather's thought and comment about the signs, the large um, uh, traffic signs. Zach said we owned one and rented one as people come into town. But in my sense is if this is going to be effective, um, we can't rely on people who are coming into town who don't understand the parking situation to like be able to absorb that information from, you know, one of those signs as they're coming into town. I think there needs to be appropriate signage on the streets so folks know where um, where it's okay to park. Um, 
the other thing is, um, and Zach, may, maybe you covered this, but I'm just looking for a little more clarity is around the situations where, like Dan alluded to, where there's only parking allowed on one side. How are we, go you know, sometimes that's, you know, like Lower Liberty, that's one thing, but there are a number of spots up Main Street and, and throughout, um, throughout the city where that really can, um, at the end of the day, put, you know, put, require people to, because they can't just park on the other side of the street, have to be somewhat distance away. So how are we going to communicate to those folks in those, I know it's a small percentage, but how can we communicate with those people so that they understand where it's safe to park and, and so that they understand, um, you know, what's going to mean for them on those certain nights in terms of getting to their car? Yeah, so um, I naturally, where I would go with this is that maybe we should look at um, developing a list of those very specific areas and communicating, um, sending out some letters uh, saying, you know, your areas is, um, you'll be impacted by this change of the uh, alternating parking and provide them with some areas that they could park um, I, without taking a full look at how many and exactly um, where those locations are. But I mean, I did just pull up the map and look at Main Street. Um, and yes, we are allowing for parking on Harrison Avenue, uh, which there wasn't before and some other places um, that are nearby. It, um, it may be worth reaching out to them individually to kind of get that word across. Also, that's the reason why um, if we get approval, the flyer will be key is so that we can start putting them on the cars for individuals and that they can have the opportunity to reach out to us so we can help solve, um, help them with their concerns about um, where to park or um, accommodate accordingly. And just a, another real small thing to add to that, and it's uh, just in terms of communication uh, to folks, is that it, we're encouraging folk, people who have off-street parking, <laughs> um, whether it's a garage or a driveway, to take advantage of it, to not... Um, just park in front of their house on a night where it's okay because there may be folks nearby. I know it's a small thing, but just encouraging people to, to, to really use the off-street parking when it's available to them because it could make a difference, even though they may not see it, but it could make a difference to the neighbor around the corner um, or something like that. So I just think that that could be included in our communications. Yeah, and that's a really good point. I think, you know, positive messaging about you know, people who have driveways and have the ability to par uh, park in them is a good thing so that um, they can really reserve the spaces for the people that truly need um, to be able to park on the street. Uh, Connor, and then I want to check to see if there's anyone who, ha who hasn't spoken yet, uh, see if um, there's other uh, comments or questions. Go ahead, Connor. Um, I think we covered it last time, uh, but as far as enforcement, um, are we looking at a little period, like a week or two, where we'd be writing warnings as opposed to actually writing tickets here, just as people ease in, into this? So in a, in a perfect world, we get approval tonight, and then we start working with PD to get these flyers out. So then between, we have about a month in, in time frame um, to help get that word out. Um, I guess at that point, we could decide whether or not we want to issue tickets on November 15th, which was what has, how it's been worded so far. Um, or if we want to hold off until we issue a ticket until maybe December 1st. Mayor, you have uh, two yeah, folks, okay. you had two folks that had their hand raised for a while, oh. uh, Dan Broberg and Stan Brinkerhoff. Okay, um, great. We'll go in that order, Dan and then Stan. Um, two quick things. One, um, I think it was Heather that was talking about the sign um, by the uh, River Street 302 roundabout. And it's not one of the um, temporary uh, light up signs. There's actually a physical like pole mounted sign that still has the old winter parking information on it. Um, so I, you're not imagining that, Heather. Um, and this, I think that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. We'll, we'll, have, 
we will have to remove those signs that have the information about the no winter parking ban, uh, the, about the current winter parking ban as they come into town. There's some on, there's one on Terrace Street, there's one on Berlin Hill. Um, so we would have to take those down and replace them. Okay, thank you. Uh, Stan, go ahead. Hi, uh, Stan Breakerhoff. I, I live on Main Street uh, in a section that would be impacted by the um, the even parking pattern. Uh, so it's certainly you know a bit biased. Um, and I, I've been you know watching the city council meetings over the last year and, and seeing some of the, the concerns around uh, Sadie Avenue and, and fire trucks and such. Um, but the documentation that's been provided so far doesn't really provide a, a reason for this. And I guess I'm I'm just a little confused. Um, in general, you know, what's what's the impetus for this? Um, there is, you know, some notes around simplifying snow removal and, and sidewalk clearing, um, but it, it it seems to kind of address a concern, which is how do we clean the streets with a strategy that instead of having a, a dozen or so parking band days, they're very clear and easy to enforce. Uh, we're basically taking 135 days and alternating parking spots. Um, this is compounded, you know, it's COVID. Um, I, I don't commute to work anymore. So my vehicle, uh, is in front of my house. So it would be moved every day simply for the sake of moving it. Um, the timing of this is, is unfortunate. It's October. Um, the folks I've reached out to in the past for winter parking are no longer offering off street commercial parking. Uh, they had a, a really bad run with COVID and folks staying home more often. And I've not been able to purchase off street parking this year. Um, and you know, I know this came up last winter with the city. I wish, I wish this was brought up during the summer and folks were brought in to kind of understand what it meant, right? Even looking through the list of streets, I think it's a three or four page list of streets and rules and, and complexity that um, one of the things the document states is that there'll be fewer tickets. And I, I struggled to understand how a couple tickets on a few parking ban nights a year is going to compare to 135 days of, of possible ticket days. Uh, when we already know there's folks who don't want to comply with this or will need to put you know, close to their house and just take a ticket. Um, it, it just, it seems, the timing seems interesting and the scope is, is unfortunate. Thank you. Um, so, you, Anne, you would like me to address some of Stan's comments? Okay. Oh, uh, so. So first of all, Stan, uh, we started this process probably a month and a half to two months ago. Um, we, it's something that we had been talking about um, since the end of last winter. Um, we have last year in particular, and um, really ever since we've made the changes to um, this uh, as needed winter ban uh, that we have currently have in place, we've really struggled with being able to maintain operational uh, levels of service. And what that means is that there were a lot of times last year that we had to go out and manually post streets for no parking, uh, such as School and Loomis um, and you know Court Street and Prospect, because we could not clear, we didn't have any time to clear the street. Um, and it made it difficult for emergency vehicles to be able to um, still get down the road. Um, so we're trying to meet in the middle. Um, Obviously, it was much easier from an operational standpoint when no one was parked on the street. Um, but we we understand that there is a, a huge need, and um, many people really rely on being able to park um, on the street. Uh, so, well, we know that there's not perfect solutions everywhere. Um, we feel that this is a way that we can um, really try to accommodate and improve the level of service. Um, with that also said, we are down staff and COVID is, um, it's a really difficult time this year. Um, so being able to do things and provide a, a better level of service um, is really important um, for us. So that's kind of the some of the reasons why we were looking at this. Um, and I don't know, you had a few questions, so I don't know if I answered all of them and, or if you want me to answer a different, uh, another one in particular. I'm, and I'm happy to follow up. I mean, I, I, I certainly understand that the need to clear the roads, right? They need to be safe. Uh, there's places that are, are very difficult and I think roads that shouldn't allow parking that, that do today, um, certainly. And 
I, I appreciate that some roads are going to be opened up. And, and again, I think I'm biased you know, given my, my situation. Uh, there is not a clear close alternative for me. Um, it, it is quite a walk to the next available parking spot on Main Street outside the parking bin. Um, but it, it seems like there should be either a possibility of, of targeted, you know, AD site, you know, cleaning or even daytime bans, right? And I have no concern with saying I can't park on on Main Street for a couple of days. It's very easy to work with. Uh, but when, you know, halfway through the winter, there's no snow on the ground, but we can't park here because of a policy, uh, it's, it's unfortunate. Stan, what is your, uh, what is your address? Uh, it's 188, it's between Loomis and Jay. Uh, I would be happy to have a conversation with you outside of this meeting and we can look at um, what options there may be um, or you know other ways to help accommodate. Um, I have a that is the correct I'm, I'm waiting uh, to see what occur when you get a chance. Oh, okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, sorry, was there any other follow up there, Stan uh, or Zach? I was just going to say that that is the crux of the issue, you know, that we've been dealing with for years. And, you know, up until four or five years ago, we had a full winter ban on all streets all winter long uh, with no alternate side. And of course, that was excellent for DPW and terrible for a lot of residents. And so we, we went to the parking ban, which um, was actually did not work particularly well. We had a lot of towed cars, uh, a lot of tickets, a lot of places that didn't get plowed properly, um, a lot of misunderstandings. Now, but I hear Stan's point loud and clear, you know, 15 or 20 nights of winter versus 135. You know, I, I think what we're seeing is that the, the old system, the, the old desk system didn't work great for the, for the residents. The, uh, the most recent system didn't work well for getting the job done that we needed to get done, and we're trying to find something in between. Hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Stephen, go ahead. Uh, I want to second uh, Stan's concern that that Bill I think just uh, referenced that the this is not uh, time sensitive weather sensitive uh, sufficiently in my also keep in mind that Montpelier is uh, in non pandemic era um, host to a huge number of uh, legislators and lobbyists and advocates who come in and are used to and are totally oblivious to these changes that are going about to happen and our public outreach system doesn't even seem to recognize that problem but can you imagine you know the legislature trying to convene and the entire thing being thrown upside down by this entirely new framework where no one's who has traditionally for years been parking in the same places uh, is allowed to park. So I, I don't have a, a quick solution. Maybe this should be a provisional trial run, um, but to craft it as an ordinance that's gonna take all the other Montpelier, uh, necessarily Montpelier visitors, um, they, by surprise, is, uh, short-sighted I think this may be an opportune time to uh, even be using zoom technology to take this up with the Capital Complex Commission and the legislative uh, leadership uh, possibly in January uh, and basically iron this out this is way too big a change to make uh, haphazardly I might is, is the way it feels to me um, I won't get into specific questions. I did go to the website and searched on parking and find, you know, table one with no table associated. All I get is a bunch of blank pages. So uh, without delving into years long repeated complaints about the inadequacy of the website, I would ask that somebody email me the PDFs of the maps and the tables. Thanks. 
I can do that right now, Steve. Thank you. Thank um, you. And I, I think you um, bring up a, a good point about um, checking in about this. Um, so I, if this is a approved uh, tonight, I, I'd love to just put it on our radars to circle back to it, perhaps next May, and talk about how it went. Um, just a little re reflection and evaluation, if that sounds good to folks. Um, um, yeah, go ahead, Zach. Just, just uh, Don and I had talked earlier that um, you know we would be willing to come back to council periodically throughout this winter if needed to kind of give status updates on how things are going, check-ins, uh, problems, you know, what are we seeing? Um, so if that's something that council wishes, um, we are okay with doing that. Okay. Um, all right. So just to check, is there anyone who has not had an opportunity to comment yet that would like to? And uh, Cameron, is there anyone whose hand is raised who hasn't spoken yet? I do not see anyone. Okay. Um, I would see, uh, I saw a hand from Heather and then Bill. Go ahead. Um, I just had a thought that maybe I understand a lot more people are home now and uh, which means their car is also home with them. But maybe this isn't a bad winter to try this out because because of the pandemic. I think people are already deterred about going out in the evening during the winter in Vermont and I have a hard time imagining that we're going to get a lot of out of state visitors this time of year during the pandemic. And I think that people, I, I know the bars will be open this winter, but I think people will be still fearful about going out in public. So perhaps the numbers of people actually out parking will be lower in the downtown area. And then I had just two questions, forgive me if you already said it, but at the last meeting you mentioned that there might be long-term parking for residents over by the rec pool. And A, I was wondering if there was another spot identified as well. And then the second question is, wouldn't there still be parking available in the lots behind the fire station and behind City Hall? So yes, there, those parking lots will still be available as they are currently for overnight parking. Uh, so you still have that. Uh, we, we met with the rec department to look at the feasibility of allowing poolside drive. Um, and they voiced some about long-term parking. They voiced some concern with um, that we have quite a bit of people that utilize uh, the North Branch Park and park on Poolside Drive. Um, so that might deter people from actually uh, to getting outdoors to exercise. Uh, but the, the other brainstormed idea that we had was uh, the Dog River Field, um, the gravel parking lot that's right there by the softball across from the Public Works facility. Um, one, it's close to us so we can maintain it. We can clear the snow there. Uh, and two, it's it's close to the bike path that people are going to walk. There's a lot of people that go out, well, right now, that take their dogs and walk down by the river and utilize that space. Um, so that was kind of another thought that we would be able to allow um, what we'll call short-term parking, um, because we don't want people leaving their car there all winter long, um, but for an extended period of time. Um, Great, thank you. Um, and Bill. Um, let's see, so I, I think I'd um, like to request that if, it, if we're only talking about an hour and, and we're trying to keep communications clear, it, it might make sense. And I, I, I'd like to request that uh, it, it stay the same downtown. That it, if that's how it's always been, the only difference being that is move from one to midnight that you actually leave it at at one and it's then it's there's some clarity for those who are not familiar or visit the town or have visited and aren't there that's 
How do you feel about that, Zach or Donna? Well, so in the down, well, first of all, as proposed, we talked about in the downtown not having parking after midnight. So there's kind of two different situations here. There is the in on Main Street, on State Street, uh, beginning at midnight, no parking either side of the street. Or there's the proposal at which people could park on uh, the alt using the alternating rule. Um, so it's 1201, it's, you know, an even calendar day, they would need to be parked on the even side of the street or they would be subject to a ticket. Um, so there's, there's kind of two different issues there. Uh, so I think Bill, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you would prefer is at least to have the alternating rule in the downtown area. No, no, and, I, I, I don't want to, if, if it's best to have it empty, it's have it empty. I, I thought that I understood that it was last year, it started at one o'clock downtown and, it, and the downtown needed to be empty. So when, it, when a winter parking ban was in effect, um, that started at 1 a.m. But what we were proposing is that in the downtown uh, beyond midnight, there wouldn't be parking. Right. So what I'm saying is you're basically saying you want to be able to clear the streets any time, any day odd or even depending throughout the city. If you want it to be downtown, you just make it the same as though you're on the, you, it was the same as last year during a winter parking ban, right? After one. So that you could clear it last year during a winter parking ban after one, just keep it at one. And, and, and the shopkeepers and, and people visiting, they'll all know that at one o'clock they need to get out of there. I don't know. I, I don't want to make a big deal out of it. It just seems like you're looking for ways to not have to communicate so many changes. And that's one that you could kind of have a, the turning point be the same time each as before. So what if the, what if the, yeah, just, it's a, it'd just be a time change for the downtown. That really wouldn't be too bad. I mean, I, we did start out at, at 10 PM with the thought that if we wanted to do overnight clearing, that we would be able to not, because normally when we have a winter parking ban, we're all geared up, we have trucks ready, we're getting ready to go at 11 p.m. And we it doesn't actually fully take an effect until one. So it's been a little bit of a, a backlog issue operationally uh, that we're kind of waiting till the clock strikes one in order to get fully going. Um, and then it's kind of a mad rush to get everything cleared up and cleaned by seven. Um, so we started at 10 p.m. and then we realized that it was going to be a little bit more difficult um, to get that word across. So that's really why we landed on midnight. Um, again, not I'm not completely opposed to moving to shifting it to one, uh, but I guess I'm looking for some direction there. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Is there uh, something in the executive order which says that the bars have to close by a certain time? I, I, I didn't think they were allowed to stay open until till one right now. I mean, I did some research this week in the Charlios and the uh, last call was at 10. So. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I saw midnight too, Connor, for bars. Well, we can always um, yeah. Yeah, amend it. Oh, Cameron's checking on it. Okay. Um, any other um, thoughts, questions, concerns? I, I guess I'll I'll just also raise. I had thought that last time we talked about um, using stakes with signs on them to say like no no parking anytime for those one. Um, you know, one side only streets as a way to simplify, like, no, you actually, you could park here all the time, except for when we stake it, and then you can't. Um, but uh, apparently, we're, we're not going in that direction. Or, like, is there any situation in which you would use those um, stakes that's, that say no parking? Uh, so potentially, if we had another issue somewhere else that, um, you know, at, to the point at which it's obstructing emergency access, we will, by order from the PD or the city manager, I can't remember which one, um, go out and put this, those stakes out. So if there was an issue, um, and that's really on any street, whether, I mean, it could be a street that has no parking on both sides all year round, 
um, you know, maybe upper Main Street that just has got a ton of snow and, you know, emergency vehicles just can't pass. So um, we're trying to do away with those manual stakes, um, but I don't, I don't know that they will be, you may still see them around town. Okay, thank you. Uh, Donna. Well, I don't know if you want comment from council members. Yeah, but, that was fun. But I really feel this is a way to go in that I think people forget the volume we had of cars being towed. We had a hard time getting towing companies to even want to bid on our service because every year they did, they ran out of storage. I mean, we were, what, four or five years of doing this alert when the storm came and people still didn't catch on. And part of it is the weather is one thing you see out the window versus the forecast DPW is using. And the fact that if you don't see snow doesn't mean that some of the movable of ice and buildup don't need to be done. So I think it's much clearer to have alternating streets. And I think year round, I, I hear complaints about our streets not being swept well and not looking good on other seasons. So I would hope that this would help regulate staff and help our expectations to be more, more dependable. And yes, I think there'll be bumps and there'll be changes, but you know, last year, I mean, for the last five years since the alert started, DPW has faithfully come back to us with updates, what's working, what's not working. And so I just expect that to continue. And it's not perfect, but I, I think it'll be an improvement. At least we'll know what it is <laughs> every day. Thank you. Thank you for all your work on this. Thanks, Donna. And do we have any uh, word yet as to what the provision is for bars closing? The time, the time that bars close. I couldn't figure out how to unmute myself. I apologize. Um, I've been looking at the ACCD, the health website, the executive order, and the safe restart, and I haven't been able to find a time limit yet uh, on bars. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist, but I haven't been able to find it yet. So stay tuned. I apologize. I think so, I got it here. It's, uh, it's up to each town. Oh. Yeah. And so we haven't changed it. So it's. It's, it's so, still, yeah. It's still two. Okay. All right. Well, in that case, um, you know, potentially we want to maybe consider a different time for the downtown. Um, so any other comments just in general? Uh, if I may. Sam Brinkerhoff is raising his hand, and then I guess we have Stephen Whitaker as well. Okay, we'll go Stephen and then Stan. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, I think that there's an opportunity here. I think if we're going to raise issues like satellite parking down at the Public Works uh, garage facility, uh, we should think about this in, in a long-range view because we had considered even discussing that with legislators, that they take satellite parking. We need to plan either bus or train from such locations up into town. And there's a real opportunity here to kind of mesh this planning, uh, even though it's it's going to be stop and start during the pandemic, mesh this planning with uh, planning that could alleviate the need for a $12 million garage. So if, if we can work with training folks and creating opportunities to park outside of town, especially the day visitors during legislative season, we may have an opportunity to actually make some real long-term progress uh, and uh, possibly have a rail shuttle up into town, uh, which would be long overdue. I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, and Stan, go ahead. Yeah. I. I I thank you all for my comment. I think my comments and, um, you know, I, I live in a, in a building that I purchased with, without off street parking. I knew that when I bought it, um, and have been able to stay there and, and grow a family in Montpelier, uh, because, because of that facility, um, we're, we're having our, our third child in January and not being able to park in front of our, of our house. Um, again, unique case for me and I'm appealing my individual case. 
uh, but there must be others. And, and I'm, I'm amazed that there hasn't been more feedback from this. Um, I, I only caught it you know, somehow, but I, I would encourage folks to you know, reach out and, and talk to folks who do have similar situations. And I understand that there's you know, public works concerns. Uh, this seems like a really big hammer to solve a problem that uh, maybe I just don't understand the scope of, uh, but it, it seems as though vehicles, the public services are provided. Uh, there's some maybe targeted places we can do better, um, but do please consider the folks that, that live here and can live here because of policies like there have been for the last six years. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Okay, so I'm going to close the public hearing. Um, what is your pleasure, Council? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm in favor of moving forward with this. Um, I think it's a sensible um, way to deal with this. I mean, I, I've been here long enough to remember, as Bill referenced, you know, when there was no off street parking um, from November through, through April. Um, and that was something people had to uh, deal with. And it was a hardship. And I think this is a, a compromise um, that, you know, can have further adjustments. And I think the willingness of DPW to work with individual, um, individual landowners that may have, um, such as Mr. Brinkerhoff, uh, a situation where you know, this, this creates a, is a particularized hardship, but I think the problem and scope that's been defined in these prior hearings uh, that Zach has pointed out about snow clearance, about overtime, about budgeting, I mean, we're going to be moving into budgeting the next segment and the cost to do snow removal and really the, the, the failings of snow removal under the current system um, you know, are just outweighed if, because we're a winter city, because we're a river valley city, we constantly have to deal with snow coming down and limited places to put it. It's not as if we can plow it all into a field. Um, and this parking system seems like a, a fairly straightforward, it's going to take an adjustment. Um, and it may not be the ultimate final solution, but at least at this time, I, I'm, I'm feeling like that the responsiveness um of dpw should help move this into into place and that ultimately this allows you know a, a sort of compromise position as far as downtown parking um you know right now i did i was just looking i don't know if any bars are staying open past midnight um but i don't have a problem with creating a, a sort of special downtown closing hour as a way of sort of um aligning this transition um you know because there are cars downtown and there may be restaurants or there may be bars um but i think that's a, a minor tweak that i i'd certainly accept um but i'm prepared to move forward with this and i would i would vote to support it i'll second okay uh, any further discussion uh lauren go ahead um, I'm going to support it too, and you know I appreciate the the comments we've heard tonight. I mean, I also view this as kind of a pilot project, and I know we'll learn a lot. And you know, trying between two extremes that have not worked well, um, so I'm sure there'll be some some bumps and some lessons learned. Um, but I really appreciate uh, Zach and Donna's kind of open mindedness and the attitude going in of let's learn, let's communicate with you know individuals that might have particularized. Um, situations. Uh, congratulations, Stan, on the new baby, and you know, see see how we can make it work um, as well as possible for um, for the community, but also recognizing all these um, challenges we've had with the previous systems, the challenges we have with staffing, um, with expenses, and so I'm just grateful to our DPW team for for coming up with this. Um, look forward to you know what we learn, and I think we can you know adjust things if we need to. Um, I, you know, things like the, the hours for the downtown, I think we could keep an eye on that. If we're creating a hardship for businesses, then I think we could, 
you know, amend that if needed. Um, so I'm going to vote in support of it as well. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, uh, so there's a motion and a second. And this, uh, just to clarify, this motion does have a, a different time for the downtown. Um, right, so, uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so that passes. Um, thank you for all of your work on this, Zach and Donna. Um, and uh, now I think we really need to just crank on getting the word out. I mean, we've, I, I know we've already tried to, to get the word out to folks that this was coming, uh, or at least it was a decision that uh, was on the table. And uh, so, but yeah, now, yeah, <laughs> it's all about messaging. It's all about getting it out there. Um, thank thank you. you again. Thank you, we appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we are going to move on to um, talking about financing. I know earlier I said we move into the budgeting, but it's really um, talking about um, the financing from the last uh, the last uh, oh, first quarter first quarter finances. Uh, but I guess in my mind, I'm thinking of it all as like this is this is the money chunk. So we're <laughs> it's like one um longer conversation in my mind um i may just say that uh it would be great if we could um regardless of where we are uh take a break at 8 30 even if we need to like pause the conversation just so that we can have a break um but uh i'm gonna uh, for this part i'm gonna turn i know this is like kind of a a quick transition here but um uh yeah i think we're gonna just dive into it uh, so I'm going to turn things over, I assume, to Kelly, unless, Bill, you also have something you'd like to say. Okay, go ahead. Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to share um, some slides to just go through the FY20 year-end um, detail and then get into um, fiscal uh, 21 and our deficit mitigation plan. And then next up after that is our um, background for fiscal 22 build. Um, and so without further ado, I'm going to get started there. Let me know if you can't see my screen for some reason, and then we'll, we'll fix it, but let's see. Um, so I am not showing the right thing. Hold on here. Too many things open at once. Is this in the packet? This uh, presentation. Uh, you'll get the details. I'm happy to provide um, the slides, but it's not in the packet. Um, there is a memo in the packet that has all of this um, summarized. Thank you. So please let me know if, if you'd like a copy. I'm happy to um, share. Yeah, if Cameron could send me the slides, I, I could look at them, but I, I don't have enough bandwidth to uh, participate through the Zoom. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so we'll just get into it. Um, so I just want to highlight really quickly that um, the FY20 numbers are unaudited. Um, we have sent our financials to the auditors. They will be here next week doing their field work. Um, but they're, they're pretty firm, um, so I think it's a good time as any to share them. Um, so just starting off, you know, where we um, put things back in April when we put this plan in place, um, we were looking at about a $500,000 gap. Um, we did put some um, reduction strategies in place. Um, you can see the departmental line items for about $245,000 listed here. Um, and then we also put in place um, staff furloughs and there were some additional items such as hiring increases, equipment delays and projects. Um, and so that um, brought us down to about $100,000 or so left for the gap. Um, and in the end, we ended up at about 85,000, 84,5 um, to be more specific, which is pretty good, all things considered. And this is in the general fund. We'll get into parking in a minute. Um, and so the general fund, um, I would have liked it to have been a little closer, but um, given the timing and the final quarter, bringing this 
to a head, we did pretty well. Um, and you know, some of the reason why we weren't able to close it completely is related to some of our transitional costs. We've had some um, staff changes, um, and then also some of our legal work. But um, you know, all in all, this is pretty good. I also want to highlight that um, in my memo, I mentioned that the sewer fund less depreciation was about 1.5 million to the good in terms of the position. That doesn't necessarily mean that's the cash we have on hand. Um, but the sewer fund is doing quite well. Um, and then, you know, getting into some of the other areas that we had talked about, um, needing maybe some resources, the senior center and the recreation department did come into the positive um, as a result of some of the actions taken. So um, those are the things I wanted to highlight in terms of where we ended up, but the two funds that did not do as well, and we anticipated that it would be the case, general fund, 84.5 and parking about 165k. Um, the general fund will be taken into account in the unrestricted fund balance, bringing the balance down to about 580k at the fiscal year's end. Um, a few things about that: um, GFOA, which is the Government Finance Association, recommends that you have two months or so on hand. Um, we have about 4% currently of our 15% target per policy, um, and we should have about 2.4 million and for, per policy about 2.1. So we're going to have to address this at some point, um, but I just wanted to kind of give you a gauge for what that really should look like um, and why, um, well, there's a little bit of money there. We, we really don't have money to spare. Um, one positive note that I uh, want to mention is that we are going to be getting some local government expense reimbursement money from the state, the tune of about $112,000. Um, we're looking at additional items that we might add to this, so we, we may get a little bit more. Um, so that'll really help us in the end. Um, not quite enough to make up the gap, and some of this money will be based on 21 expenses in the first quarter, but it's something. And um, I think that, you know, considering where we started as this all hit, you know, we are um, positioned to go into 21 um, in a way that, you know, allows us to really fully utilize the deficit mitigation plan that we put in place, knowing that 21 would likely be worse than 20. Um, so with that, I'll get into the first quarter of 21, unless if there are any other questions or, or general questions at this point. Um, can, if I can ask a question about the government expense reimbursement grant, is that CARES money or what is, um, what is that from? So it is COVID money um, that's being filtered down through to municipalities um, for things like um, cleaning, sanitizing supplies and PPE. Um, and so at the start of this, we coded a lot of our expenses so that we would be able to track them. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so getting into fiscal year 21, um, we did act pretty quickly knowing that, you know, things were just, um, you know, not good per se. Um, and so we put in a $1.4 million deficit mitigation plan that you can see here on your screen. And we've um, been able to implement that. And as a result, um, you know, we are looking good in terms of meeting our targets and meeting, you know, what the conditions really predict at this point, which are pretty uncertain and are, you know, uncertain at the state and federal level. So we'll do what we can and do our best. Um, and so here are the line items. Um, getting into some of the detail, um, Revenue projections in the aggregate seem to be holding. We are getting state pilot funds, which is good because we did project a proportional down to the amount of local options taxes that we had not necessarily been receiving due to restaurants and shops being closed. But then conversely, the parking fund is not doing well. And so the amount of those two things based on the um, down in parking, um, kind of wash each other out. So we're not necessarily to the better, we're kind of where we thought we would be. 
Um, in terms of spending, um, we are right on target. We wanted to be between the seven to nine percent less spent range at this point of a quarter through the year. Um, and we're doing that. Um, and so it's a testament to folks sticking to the plan and conserving where we can. Um, and so that's good. Um, but at this point, there is still so much that's uncertain and things are changing. Um, I was on a call late last week um, that, you know, the, the state at the state level, the state economists were saying that they are modeling like they would for private industry, whereas they would only model twice a year in January and July. And so it just kind of goes to show some of the volatility that we're seeing um, and turbulence. And so to the extent that we can conserve and preserve our resources, um, you know, I think we'll be able to maintain our current position, hopefully, and we'll keep an eye on things um, each quarter to see, you know, what's happening. So um, with that, you know, my recommendation would be to keep the current plan in place um, to see, you know, how things end up um, to keep, you know, spending to the bare minimum and only focusing on essential items. Maintaining our hiring freeze, um, part of the plan um, was to freeze um, some positions for the full year and some for the first quarter. Some of those first quarter positions are DPW winter maintenance positions. So we'll need to consider, you know, maybe possibly bringing them back depending on what the plans are. Um, and then in terms of equipment and infrastructure, um, at this point, only replacing upon failure rather than, you know, um, investing in, you know, planned um, purchases based on our capital planning. Um, and then we are doing a, a broader parking fund review right now to kind of see, you know, what's tracking and some of the recommendations for FY22 builds will be pulling some of the operational staff costs off the parking fund and putting them back onto the general fund because we just don't have the funding there to support those um, positions. Um, and then, you know, if conditions do improve, which they will eventually, just we're not sure when, um, you know, we'll, we'll consider plans at that point for restoration. But it's, um, at this point, we, you know, don't have the means to restore. Um, and so we don't have a prioritization plan, um, but will when the time comes. Um, so that's what I have for the status of our current finances, you know, coming out of 20 into 21. Um, and then we can get into 22 budget builds here when you're ready. Uh, go ahead, it's uh, eight o'clock here. So we, I think we've got a little more time before break. If folks are okay. Any other questions? Um, uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious. So if we're operating under the replacing equipment and infrastructure at point of failure, are there, I mean, I know this is just this fiscal year, obviously that seems like a very poor way to manage government over the long term. Um, but hearing that there's like, you know, some of the, the projections are like, we're gonna be in a slump until 2027 or, any, you know, so we'll have to do some deep thinking in the future. But, you know, just, just curious if there's, you know, are there things that we've put off that are like gonna put us in a precarious situation or unable to manage anything? Are there, are there concerns that that is raising for the city staff and any departments by operating with the, you know, do we, do we expect to get to point of failure or is that some, something that we we don't foresee but we um you know obviously anything could happen things, things break well i mean we are right now doing a deep dive on the capital planning anything that was put off in 21 it will be put into 22 for consideration um and so you know we are holding the line um that being said you know it will likely um be something that we'll have to consider in future years you know because as you mentioned through 27, we'll need to really actually think about things a little bit differently than we are right now. And I don't know that we'll necessarily be able to do the current plan, that, but I, I do think that we will get a plan in place to meet the city's needs and to really focus on um, core services. So I would jump in there too and say, you know, to, to maybe more directly answer the question is yes. I mean, it's definitely a problem. Um, you, you know, we, uh, but 
we also had to close a $1.4 million gap, which, you know, you all rallied with us and, and approved the budget. Um, and as Kelly said, um, she and DPW staff were working really hard to sort of put together the priorities for what got shifted. Um, but I, I don't, I think we're kidding ourselves if we don't think that um, stuff that was should have been not only purchased for equipment, but roads and other infrastructure that should have been fixed in this fiscal year in 21, or even maybe at the end of 20 when we were pulling the plug, that will now get put into the 22 budget. Um, but then we're going to, you know, we probably won't be able to fully fund 22 either. So we might maybe in 22 be able to get done what we were going to do in 21. That means everything that was on the list for 22 is going to be out. 23 in future years. I mean, this is definitely going to have a domino effect, and, and we can't kid ourselves differently. I mean, that those are the facts, and, and um, you know, short of proposing some sort of giant tax increase, which I don't think we're going to want to do either. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really bad, you know, it's a very difficult situation, and, and certainly that is not the best way to manage any kind of operation. Um, and what you know, as you know, when we talked about this year um, in the spring, we did the, the short-term mitigation plan for FY20 and then this plan. You know, I think all of us in the room were hearing information that by now things would be getting better and maybe even by the second half of the year we could be thinking about restoring things and that by FY22 budget we'd be back to our normal cycles. Well, you know, clearly that's not going to be the case. So what we're struggling with right now internally, and obviously we'll have talks about this in a few minutes, but also um, more over November, December, January, is how do we look at this as a longer term problem and how do we reset priorities and how do we, you know, you can't put off purchases forever, you can't put off road maintenance and projects forever. Um, what services do we have to back away from? What funding, you know, what, what are these decisions? Because you know, we're not going to close a $1.7 million gap by just tinkering around the edges. So, yeah. yeah, fair. Uh, Connor, then Dan. Um, could, could I ask you, Kelly, to break down the parking maybe even more than like just with the quarter there? Um, month by month, are there like positive indications that people are using these spaces more? It's, it's not. No, that... it's, it's actually pretty dire <laughs> to be. Blunt, uh, it's just not good. We're, you know, seeing probably about thirty-four thousand dollars in revenue generally, um, and you know we're spending about a hundred and fifty thousand. So we're overspending, you know, what we would um, for that line. And I can get you the exact numbers in terms of, you know, what we would be anticipating. We're anticipating um, somewhere in the range. Uh, let me just get the exact number for you, but. Yeah, it's um, one of those things where, you know, things are just not rebounding like we thought they would. Are, are we at the point where, so the salaries are less than we're actually taking in in revenue, and we should be talking about, like, repurposing staff and shutting off the meters? That's a conversation we're having internally, and we'll have a recommendation for it. Yeah, so the, for the parking meter revenue, for example, we should be taking in $663,000 annually. And so when you divide that on the quarter, you know, we're just not even really hitting a baseline. Yeah. Thank you. Um, before we go to Dan, um, Kelly, was there more to your presentation about um, setting up things for FY22. I do have um, additional slides for FY22 if you wanted to go there. Um, okay, well, that's just good to know. Um, go ahead, Dan, and then we'll get back into your um, presentation. Go ahead, Bill. All right, I just wanted to provide one more piece of information to Connor's question about parking. Um, because the part, one of the issues, and Kelly referred to it, but just to, to say it maybe in, in layman's terms, parking obviously pays for the the folks that are out there doing the work, you know, the, the parking enforcement people. But it also pays for leases. We have some leased parking spaces. The city owns some, but we also have leases. And it pays to maintain them. So a portion of parking revenues go to DPW and, and by extension, the cemetery for plowing and 
cleaning and, and all those sorts of things and, and portions offset some of our staff time who work with parking. So a portion of the police department is set up for enforcement. So in addition to the, the salaries of just the, the three individuals that work in parking, that's really for you economists out there, that's the true marginal cost of sort of providing parking tomorrow is how much we're paying them versus how much we're coming in. But really, if you take it just a little further back, you know, all of this money that's being spent. So one of one of the budget issues we've got to overcome for next year, and you heard Kelly talk about reallocating some of those funds, is is the amount of things that are that are being charged to parking that are legitimate parking expenses but we can't cover. So that means they've got to come back to the general fund, you know, portion of my pay, for example, because I deal with parking. So I don't know, some, some, some percentage, I don't know what it is, of my pay is paid by parking. Well, if we pull that out, that means the general fund, the tax budget needs to cover that. So it's a compounding problem. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a little more complex than just what are the folks on the street, but they are the, definitely the, the margin of providing parking tomorrow is the cost of those people. Thank you um, for that. Yeah, it's helpful. Uh, Dan, go ahead. Well, picking up on on some of this parking conversation, I guess I, I had two questions. One is um, in breaking down those numbers, I mean, is there a particular part of the parking or parking system that's being underutilized that is resulting in this shortfall? Um, you know, streets versus lots or particular lots or particular streets, or is it just an overall shortfall? Well, I would say it's because of those things, but it is generally a shortfall. I mean, we turn the meters on first and then the lots. And so we were kind of waiting until October 15th to really get a true assessment of where we stand for both, um, you know, areas um, so that then we can really drill down and get a sense of, you know, what's not being utilized, but you know, generally it's under utilization. You know, we're not seeing the traffic that we were pre-COVID. You know, state employees being away from the city and people not necessarily coming into the city as much. You can see it. And those lots are wide open, so people can park there. Hey, you know, right. Um, Bill, what are, our, uh, I mean, do we have options as far as revenue sources? I mean, we obviously have property taxes that we take in. And as you indicated, one option is to raise the property taxes, which I, I don't know. I don't think there's much stomach, but, um, you know, the other is the sales tax, which I presume is down the option tax. I mean, um, we, don't, we don't have a local sales tax. We have rooms, meals, and alcohol tax. So, right, I, that's what I meant. Uh, right, so obviously those are down. People are not renting rooms. They're not eating out as much. They're not drinking out as much. Um, so absolutely they're down. And I think even all of that I think is down statewide um, as well as, I mean, you know, we've all seen it just this fall, right? We haven't seen the tour buses. We haven't seen all those kinds of things. So that's one of our revenues. Um, our, we have parking, of course. Property tax is, is, our, is far away our biggest. Uh, our fee revenues for things like recreation, senior center, um, you know, program revenue, those have been largely closed. Uh, and you know, we're just starting to bring those back. But again, participation isn't the same as, as it has been. Um, you know, our building, I think our building permits and zoning permits, surprisingly, have, have stayed okay. And I don't think they're going to be right where we thought they were, but we've actually had a, some development. Um, activity um, but really you know all of our operating revenues are just are just down and we don't have i mean one of the struggles for us and i think most municipalities I, mean, I think we have a more diversified revenue source than most municipalities in vermont do uh, which is great most of the time but right now you know uh, it, it's hitting us and you know when i talk about property tax increase i mean it's a 20 cent increase to make up the difference i mean that's you know unheard of i mean that's you know that's not really i don't think i mean you guys make that call not me but it's hard to think that that's really on the table so um you know that's the kind of order of magnitude we're talking about right. as opposed to 
you know, the normal one or two cents based on inflation or something like that. Right. Right. And just to be clear, when you say 20 cents, you're, you're talking about 20 cents for every taxable. hundred. hundred. Right. So if the tax rate was a dollar per hundred, it would be a dollar 20 per hundred. So. Right. So but it, it, that's about right. It'd be roughly 20% increase. We're, we're close to a dollar. It might be not exactly. But. So, you know, I, I mean, obviously it's a conversation you can have, but I, it, you know, there's also people out there that are out of work and struggling. Yeah. Well, I guess my, my last question is, you know, to what extent are we building a budget that um, is, as you said before, one that's looking to just sort of get us to the other side as we did with the cuts before, and one that might just simply envision uh, a smaller group of city services. Uh, for well, I'd like to defer that question, if I could, to the to the next conversation okay. we're about to go into. I, you know, I was just trying to. Yep. No, I'm happy to hold that back. I was going to lay that groundwork out, and to some extent, you all are going to provide some guidance on on how we do that. I think that's. Yeah. Uh, Thanks. It's a policy question, in part. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, go ahead, Kelly. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen again. Um, let me know um, if you cannot see it. And here we go. I'm almost there. Hold on. Can I ask somebody, can I ask Cameron to email me the 22 slide? On it. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Um, so here are the assumptions. Um, I also want to start off by saying that um, budget instructions were issued to city staff last week um, on October 2nd or maybe a week past now. But anyway, um, these are some of the assumptions that were outlined therein. Um, so just going down the line, um, no growth in revenues and downgrades projected, no growth in the grand list, um, no unrestricted fund balance, below re recommended policy thresholds, which we just discussed um, briefly in the last briefing, um, salary and benefit projections to be absorbed within existing budgets. Um, unfortunately, this year there will be a 27th pay period, um, which is uh, kind of a double whammy for us. Health insurance will increase by 8% or $135,000, which is less than last year's increase. Um, it's kind of crazy to be thinking that 8% isn't so bad when last year was 25%. Um, I will also note that we are getting some information um, from Hickok and Boardman that they're scrubbing this number a little bit. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but this is what we have um, for right now. They're gonna try to, you know, maybe get it down a little bit and we'll see if our experience can support that. Um, and then um, the capital improvement plan and equipment plans will be for essential project and equipment failure only. That's extreme, but I think, you know, it's an extreme time. And so we're um, reviewing the capital plans right now um, for things that are shifting from 21 into 22, and then also really looking at everything um, to see what really needs to be on the list and what needs to be discussed as we move forward. Um, so this, these revenue projections were outlined in the memo um, that was with the packet for background. Um, but uh, generally, we're projecting about $595,000 of a revenue downgrade. Um, this is a you know, good estimate, but I also want to caution that we're only taking state pilot down by 10% reduction, which is what you know, some of the instructions have been for reductions at the state level. Um, if this is to trend with local option taxes, which we didn't see in 20. We actually ended up seeing what we thought we would. So that's why I ended up taking it down by, you know, what seemed reasonable. This could be more. So I just want to caution there where this is, you know, an estimate right now. We'll keep working on this as new information comes in. Um, but property taxes likely will be down by a little bit, which they were last year. Um, pilot payment will be down. Um, we'll keep an eye on that. Local options taxes and current use will likely be down. State highway aid, um, we'll keep an eye on that as well. Um, but the transportation fund is not doing particularly well. 
uh, the school resource officer based on the ongoing conversation. I've taken the school portion down, um, not expecting that we would receive that from the school. And so it's a conversation, but I wanted to put that in here as a placeholder. Um, I did put down permits and fees. Um, we'll have to see how things are coming in. Um, we, like Bill mentioned, are you know seeing some development. So this might actually end up swinging to the good, but I also didn't want to book it as positive until we know. Um, but right now, it's a down. And then ambulance, right now we're seeing, uh, based on experience, a down. Um, and I will keep an eye on things to see if that continues. And then penalty and interest, um, that's also projected to come in down. And then um, the parking fund is the other area where um, the revenues are just not likely to come in. Um, and so based on the staff allocations that Bill was alluding to, to the parking fund, the estimate that I have right now based on the budget system is about $425,000 um, for you know all city staff that are non-enforcement um, staff. So um, as you can see, it's a pretty big chunk of the, um, the uh, gap that we have right now. Um, and so moving on to the expense projections, we're building the budget right now with a capital improvement plan that tracks to what we have planned for FY22 in terms of the you know, um, conditions or criteria or you know, caps for what we might spend on certain items. That being said, you know, we're using this as a baseline and then we'll also let you know what we you know, keep in or take out. Um, so then you have a full estimate of you know, what it would look like if we could fully fund it and then what it means if we end up you know, having to pull things out to support the gap. Um, for personnel, we um, got some details here on some of the general expenses um, related to personnel costs. If we were to increase the budget by just personnel, it'd be about 4.8 cents or about 4.5%, which is what we did this past year. Um, and then we get a little bit, bit of information here um, on our health insurance. Um, and then I want to take a little bit of time on the operating items here um, in the gap table that I provided. Um, there's a little bit more detail, um, but some of the things that I want to highlight is we do have the reappraisal coming up and that's something that we you know, have to do. And so part of that will be in 22, part will be in 23 um, at $130,000 total to 60. Um, and then the elevator in City Hall is not ADA compliant and needs to be refurbished. Um, and so that's about $100,000 cost. So I tried to list the things that are things that we really should do. Um, and then there are items that also need to be put on the table for discussion, such as Confluence Park, $20,000. Um, we um, would need to likely find that. The parking meter upgrades is something that would likely be supported by the parking fund, but right now we do not have the means to support an upgrade. Um, so we'll be working on that. Um, there's $134,000 for the TKS property that we would need to find um, funding for. And then other items that have been sort of in the mix, um, the LED streetlights, the Berry Street intersection, and then the recreation center renovation project. So there may be other things that come up over the course of budget development, and I'll brief you on those as they come up. But those are some of the things that are kind of out there right now. Um, so then here's the gap sheet. Um, and so um, in the total column, you can see that there's about $2.6 million in items that we need to cover. And then when you look at the general fund side of things, it's about 1.6, almost 1.7 or an 11% increase in GF over FY21. Um, and then you can see that it's about a 20 cent increase on the tax rate. I'm gonna leave the slide right here. The next slide is key budget dates that we can kind of talk about. And um, then I also wanted to kind of get some guidance from you on how you wanted the um, Capital Improvement Committee to run, because um, we'll need to sort of make some moves on that soon so that we can get things rolling. We are on target to have plans in place for review for the schedule, um, but I also want to get a sense of composition and um, what kinds of details you'd really like us to get into and bring you. So with that, that's what I have for the FY22 background for now.
and um, if you got questions, please let me know. Um, Lauren and then Connor, go ahead. Um, this is not, you know, the, the biggest line item, but I know at one point we had talked about the idea of seeing, I think we have to build it into the budget, but the um, reappraisal process, if there was a way to see if we could either get relief from the legislature, since it sounded like they had changed the threshold not that long ago um, that we hit. And so I, I still think it's worth looking into that. I mean, of all years to have to do that, this is just such a hard time to find an extra 130,000 to start that if we could either ask for a delay or a temporary shift back to the old threshold. So we wouldn't have to commit to that. I'm imagining the next two years are gonna be challenging budget years. Um, so I would just uh, throw that back out there as one idea. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Connor. Did you like the retirement incentives at all? Um, you know, it's, um, we've talked about it generally, but um, not in detail. Um, and it all depends, you know, on what the pool of city employees is right now. So we'd have to get into the details to really fully vet that. I would feel I could use your assistance on answering that more fully. Yeah. Uh, so the, we, um, the, good, the good part about being in the VMERS retirement plan is, you know, when we're all the other municipalities around the state and it's managed by the state treasurer. So, you know, it's a stable plan. The bad news is it's not particularly flexible in terms of offering early buyouts and those kinds of things. Um, you know, you can't tailor it to your own community. It really would have to be something that was done by the system. So the city would have to look at things like either giving someone a bonus, which might help their, their final payout or offer to pay health insurance for a period of time, those kinds of things. So, you know, we, we haven't really put anything out specifically each year at budget time. We take a look and see who may or may not be retiring and what their circumstances are and have a conversation with them about what, you know, I mean, we have good employees, uh, but we've had a lot of people retire in the last few years too. I don't know that we have that many people right on the threshold of, you know, I, I know we were doing a scan for that in anticipation of this to see if there were any anticipated retirements. And I don't think we have that many, you know, people close. So unless you want to get rid of me, which is fine. Other comments or questions? Um, I think we will probably want, uh, I'll have a few more comments about this, but it is just about 8.30. And so I'm wondering if now would be a good time to take a break. Also, if um, members of the public um, have things to say about this, we want to uh, hear from you all as well. Um, but I, I think we'll, we'll still go ahead and take a break, and then we'll, we'll continue to talk about this. Um, unless there's any burning comments or questions from council. OK. All right. So. Um, it is just about 8.30 right now. Let's take, uh, is five minutes okay? Or, do you, or would you prefer 10? I have to sneeze, oh gosh. Okay, um, I'm seeing a couple votes for 10. Let's go 10 minutes and we'll be back here at 8.40, okay. So uh, in light of that, Kelly, is there anything further you wanted to add? Uh, about framing thinking for FY22? Uh, no, um, I think okay. that really kind of covers it. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Bill, anything you want to add? Okay. Um, I, I have a few uh, comments about this. So, Obviously, these are extraordinarily unfortunate circumstances, and I think this might be the most strained budget season I have ever, I have ever participated in or ever witnessed, and I wonder if it's, if that's probably true for others as well. Um, so, I'm usually 
Well, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself um, in making assumptions about where we're going um, with this. <clears throat> and so in order to not get ahead of myself, um, I'm just going to put out there that um, I've already drafted this year's budget uh, survey, which will go to all the city councilors uh, and ask some policy level guideline uh, kind of questions about how you are thinking about this budget. Um, I think in the past we have had questions on the budget survey that said, you know, if there was anything you were up for cutting, what would it be? And in the past we've gotten away with being able to say nothing. I think we are doing a great job with everything and we shouldn't cut anything. Um, and I think you know, we, we said that last time and, well, maybe not last time, but uh, I think regardless of whatever we said last time, we had to cut more things because the revenue was so short. Uh, and so I, I think coming into this uh, budget season, we have to take those kinds of questions about what we're going to let go of uh, pretty seriously. So in light of that, um, we could take a little bit of time right now to say, you know, if folks have um, general, like big picture general thoughts they'd like to share about how they're thinking about this budget, you know, you're welcome to share them now, but we'll have more time at future meetings to get into details and uh, specifics. So, but if folks have things they would like to share at this point uh, in terms of the big picture now would be the time. And um, and then I think we'd also like to uh, hear from the public as well. And just bear in mind that we're at the beginning of this conversation and uh, it'll continue for meetings until January, basically. Um, so starting with the with the council, any any big picture thoughts you'd like to share? If not, that's okay. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Um, I mean, one one challenge, and I don't know if Kelly or Bill has any sense. I mean, I guess one way I'm thinking about it is, you know, if we anticipate, you know, we're kind of in the worst of it in a year from now, it's going to be not great but better but we're going to be able to have you know fully open restaurants again and and things like that um you know but we're still going to have lost businesses and people are still going to be hurting um i'm just wondering if there is like you know some assessment or sense you have right now of you know we'll bounce back but it will only be a little bit so it changed my long-term thinking of you know are we able to you know like we talked about earlier you know punt on some things and try to, you know, slowly make up for that gap in the coming years, or are there entire programs that it's like for the next five to 10 years, we don't know if we could even go there. And so I don't know how much sense you have from either previous economic downturns that are more typical to learn from, or um, I don't know, I'm just like how, for me, I would rather do like the stuff that is not like cutting core services that are going to be harder to build back later um, versus things that we could kind of push off but don't undermine the integrity of the, the city government or, or staffing. So um, I'm, I don't know if I'm making any sense, but I'm just kind of wrestling with that. Like, is, is, there, is there a sense or do we think we'll have by December, you know, from our state economists and others, like any, any better sense of how long and deep the pain is? Um, to be able to kind of weigh those different approaches? Well, so I'd say that's the central question in this budget right there. You hit it right on the head, Lauren. And, you know, I don't think we as staff have any more knowledge or information than any of you have. Um, you know, unlike other downturns, it's not cyclical or it's not, uh, you know, gee, if there's interest rate changes or this happens or, you know, there's a, there's a stimulus, then that will get things, you know, whatever. This is due to a, a disease, a pandemic that we don't know the horizon for. 
and we don't know how it's going to be harnessed and we're seeing uh, you know a new growth around the country of it right now and frankly we're not seeing a lot of, uh, of a centralized effort to contain it um so we don't know what what we're facing um you know if there's suddenly a vaccine and it's widespread and it can be implemented then you know it's a whole new ball game but there's also you know it's one of the things we're trying to do i think at our end and it's not going to answer your question per se but we're trying to get a taking a look at the re, the non-tax revenues and, and think about that you know what's what's the worst it can possibly be what's normal and you know what would be something in between and what does that mean and i think what that could lead us to doing is preparing a budget that says all right you know here's based on what we know today this is you know just say it's what kelly just laid out okay we've got 1.7 million dollars gap we've got to close so we're going to cut these things out but here's potential you know potential increases and so we could then just like we're doing now sort of reviewing where we're at quarterly if, if we start seeing return on some of these things, maybe things can be slowly put back because those aren't based on the property tax, they're based on these other revenues. And, um, you know, I mean, really it's not unlike, like I said, the situation we're in right now, we made these, these cuts for this current year saying, all right, then every quarter we'll check in and see what we're doing. And we might just have, you know, we may be in that mode for a couple of years where, where we're prioritizing our risk, you know, this is what we won't do unless it gets better. And, and I, you know, I don't have a magic answer yet. Like I said, you know, we just, the presentation you just got, um, you know, the staff just got last week. So this is, this isn't like, you know, we're collect now we're collecting the recommendations from people. And I would say that the staff as a whole, our sense was we need to look at this as though we're going to be in this for a couple. I think they did not want to take on the rosy outlook only to then have to crush it back down again. It was let's let's take the hard line and build back if it's good news. So if if I may also take a crack at that question as well, I want to put in context that we will be defer we basically deferred quite a bit of maintenance from this past summer. It's very likely, I think, that we're going to be continuing to defer maintenance uh, purchases, et cetera, for this fiscal year, even though we'd planned on, on moving forward with maintenance and, and purchases. Uh, and as uh, Bill said earlier, we really can't defer maintenance forever. And so just so you all know where my mindset is, is that I think that means uh, slumming down of services and being really fiscally savvy and honestly conservative about how we're spending our money. It really scares me. That scares, scares me is the wrong word. Um, it, I find it concerning that we are at 4% of our operating, um, or our, our, yeah, our recommended policy, um, budget policy. I don't feel like I have the right word there. When we're supposed to be at 15%. Unassigned fund um, balance. Unassigned fund balance, thank you. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, we may see future hard years. And so I'm interested in building that up as a better buffer for ourselves moving into the future. Um, if things do go better than we expect, I would, I, again, this is me getting ahead of myself, but I'll just let you know, the way I'm thinking about this now is that I would rather plan for the worst and hope for the best. And then when things are a little better than we planned, I would like to see some priority given to having that money go towards the unassigned fund balance in preparation for any future efforts and to get towards that 15% uh, policy. That's just me. There were some other hands, Donna and then Jay. Thank you. Um, 
I probably even more negative than you. <laughs> and that I feel like we're heading into some real national crisis. And as much as Vermont has insulated ourselves, uh, November, December, and January, whoever wins the election is going to be really, really hard on the economy. The virus is already showing itself here in Vermont, and we have had good behavior. And, it, and the indoorness is only going to increase it. So I would say we have to look at last year and double the problems and really, really go on a strictly thin, thin diet for the next year. And that means just any cash you can have, keep it. Don't spend it. So that's where I'm coming from. Thank you. Uh, Jay. Yeah, no, I, I'm in absolute agreement with Donna and Anne on, on our um, cash and, and how we're managing specific budgets. I guess I, I head into this process trying to, with the mindset that this isn't just like an economic recovery, like we're trying to get back to how it was. This is an economic redefinition that we need to um, think that there will be a new normal um, and I won't say post COVID because what does that mean? Right. Um, I just think that we need to be, as we're thinking about economic development and growth and supporting Montpelier's downtown and local businesses that we need to think about what that's going to look like in the short term, midterm and long term. And you can, you know, assign timeframes to each of those, but, um, just being strategic in terms of how we invest and how we partner with, local organizations um, and position ourselves to, um, you know, to, to be ahead of the curve in the new economy. I think that that's how um, we'll, we'll be able to position ourselves to, you know, be able to be successful as, as we move forward. So I totally get that, that like, that's very nondescript and kind of heady and, and not in the weeds in terms of what we need to do in terms of budget. But when I think about how we're investing the very, the, the, the small amount of money we might have into how we grow our local economy, I think that that's where our mindset needs to be, not just trying to figure out how, how we used to have it, but thinking about how we can be ahead, um, be leaders in how it could be in the, in the, in the future. So thanks. Great, thank you. Who else have thoughts they'd like to share? Uh, Dan, go ahead. Sure. <clears throat> I think I'll build on the comments that we've heard already because I, I uh, you know, I am in agreement with with what's been said. I guess I would also add uh, on top of that that I think we have to be very careful. Um, the when we look at the revenue, um, you know, the taxpayers uh, of Montpelier aren't going to be in a position any more um, than anyone else to bear any of these costs. And, you know, certainly as Bill was indicating, you know, to shift some of these lost revenue costs to maintain as we, as we are is a 20% 20, 20 jump. And that's just not realistic in any way, shape or form. But I think even, even lower than that, we really have to be cautious. This is the year to um, not to hit taxpayers because a, a lot of these economic impacts are going to start to hit people um, in the new year. Uh, stimulus funds running out and employment uh, and businesses being unstable. I think we have to be very, very cautious of that. So it's, it's sort of the, um, the twin uh, uh, problems. Uh, I'm trying to think of the names from Greek mythology where you're going between the whirlpool and the, the snake infested rocks. But, um, you know, this is, uh, this is the problem that we're going to have to steer this boat between. And, and I think the only way we can do it is to look at it not as a temporary issue. This is not a, well, let's just hold our breath and get to the other side of that. Um, and this is something where we're going to have to um, reinvent some of these issues. And, and I think in some ways identify what are the core things, you know, I've been on boards where, you know, the, the object is who's the last person in the room to turn out the lights and building up from there. I, I, I don't mean to, to make that kind of, 
suggestion that we're doing that here, but I think we do have to identify our core services. What are the things that we absolutely have to provide? Um, because I think we are going to have to think, make some really tough, hard choices um, this coming year. And I think we have to make them structurally. Yeah. Never thought I'd find myself in this kind of having to make these kinds of decisions, but here we are. Um, other thoughts from council? Oh, okay, Jack, go ahead. You know, it's, this is very tough. For, for many years, I've always recognized and really appreciated that, uh, that the people of Montpelier really appreciate and value the services they get from the city. And people have always been willing to pay what it takes to uh, maintain those services. And the taxes that people pay to pay those services you know, are also an investment in, literally an investment in people's homes because part of the reason that we have the value property tax uh, properties that we do is because of the uh, value of services that we get from the city and the, and the way Montpelier is such an attractive place to live. And so, you know, but people are not taxing themselves an extra 20 cents to, uh, to maintain what, what we have now. Um, we also don't want to be in a position of saving or ha having the city be so significantly and the city services be so significantly degraded that what we're left with is not the recognizable and value valued um, set of uh, er, city. And so it's, you know, you know we're all, we all serve on these committees and we're talking about all these great plans we have. You know, we've talked about the, uh, the downtown master plan. We've talked about the uh, downtown scoping study, the transportation, but everything involves what can we do to make, uh, make the, the city and the downtown better for everyone who lives here and everyone who uses the city. And so we'll have to think about how to, how to do that with very constrained uh, finances. Yeah. Um, Lauren, was that a hand? Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just one consideration, you know, so by the time that we're doing this budget, we will have seen the election, which, you know, depending on how that goes, could make it either much less or more likely that there would actually be some dollars flowing to state and maybe city government, hopefully. Um, just thinking about, you know, depending on how that goes, if, if there does seem like there's some likelihood, and obviously it's really hard to plan, but if we're doing that kind of waterfall approach where if money came, you know, I guess thinking about the types of dollars that would be most likely to come in. And so if we're doing our budgeting, um, you know, just adding that kind of nuance to, to how we might shape a kind of, you know, wish list if dollars came in um, based on the kind of constraints that might be tied to that money. Um, not to be the Pollyanna-ish one here, <laughs> not actually feeling very po Pollyanna-ish about the world right now, but um, but hopefully we're in that position where where uh, we have that that opportunity, or at least should be planning for if if you know the log jam does break, that if we get dollars that we're we're set up as well as possible to take advantage of it, um, because we've got the right kinds of projects and stuff ready to go. Cool. Um, any comments from the public? Uh, yes, Steve Whitaker here. Go ahead, Stephen. Um, I want to take issue with one thing that Jack said about uh, people have been willing to pay whatever it takes to maintain. And we have neglected our maintenance dramatically on our public works, our sidewalks, our streets, our 
And, and so now this is compounding that. Um, and this may actually reorient the economy for decades to come. Uh, the legislature has no plans to come back to Montpelier now, which is going to impact rooms and meals and, you know, all the downtown commerce uh, and parking to a good, to a, to a beneficial effect. But my point is we should really uh, reassess our priorities. We should do some serious uh, uh, thrift, uh, necessary cuts. Uh, when we talk about essential services, I'm going to raise now and later in the agenda the issue of public bathrooms. You know, we you got you're taking 25 percent on Kelly's presentation from the homeless task force. I would take the rest of it because they have not done what you charge them to do for an entire year and use that to pay someone to staff the transit center in the off hours and keep those bathrooms open. We're going to have a displacement of people. The more people with better means come from out of state to buy up housing and rent apartments because it's safer here, you're displacing local people. So we're going to have an increased evictions are going up. We're going to have an increased uh, crunch of services. So we really need to rethink and reorient what our, our real goals are, not just our professed goals of compassion and progressive and egalitarian, but we need to get real serious about uh, identifying our core goals and core values and put safety nets in place. We need to cut some of the fat out of our budget. Um, and I'll, I'll have more to say about it later, but I think that's, that's kind of intro to where uh, my thinking is going on this. This is, not, this is very serious, and it's not uh, something that we should, even if we do get a million or five in federal relief grants, uh, that's still not going to solve the problem that we've created or that we ourselves and nature, COVID, has created for us. So uh, that's my uh, sobering uh, wake-up call. Thank you, Stephen. Any other um, members of the public want to comment on this? And Cameron, are you seeing anyone? No, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I think for now, we'll leave it there. Council, look for uh, the budget survey that's going to come out probably within, um, I'll probably send it out tomorrow. Um, and yeah, if you could fill that out. Ideally, um, within the week, uh, well, within a week. So if it comes out tomorrow, you know, ideally by next Thursday or so would be wonderful. Um, and with that, we're going to move on from now. Um, again, I know that's kind of a hard transition again, but uh, there we are. Okay, so uh, I just want to recognize that it is nine o'clock and we have about seven items uh, on the agenda still. Some of which I think we really do need to get to. Um, so I'm cautiously optimistic that we can get to uh, some of them, or all of them actually. Uh, so, but I just wanna say, let's, let's be brief if we can. Um, Otherwise, I think we're gonna have to jettison some things. Um, so I know uh, Dan is on the line and uh, talk about Montpelier Alive. So uh, uh, thanks for being here, Dan, and uh, go ahead. Thanks, I, I promise to take no more than three minutes of your time. Wow. So, unless you want more than three minutes of my time, in which case I will give you as much time as you would like. Um, yeah, so we've been, you know, continuing to work hard to support existing businesses in Montpelier. Um, from our uh, surveys that we've been doing monthly, things are improving, um, but they're not amazing um, by any stretch of the imagination. So um, we now see the average business is at about 75% of their uh, comparable revenue from last year um, and about, um, 80% of businesses uh, report that they're now breaking even. Um, just as a comparison, that figure was 5% in May. 
of businesses reported that they were breaking even. Um, so better. <laughs> um, in many cases, the staffing levels are down more significantly than the, the revenue um, as businesses try and cut costs and, and get to that break even point. So um, I'm most worried, as I think you've heard about, of um, with food and beverage and hospitality type businesses coming into the winter uh, with the lack of outdoor dining. I think the capacity restrictions are going to be much more impactful on them than on the retail stores. Um, and I think for some of the retailers as well, this is sort of going to be a make or break holiday season. Um, I think if we are to see businesses um, close, it will be after the holidays, um, you know, try and get through this good period, hopefully. Um, but, you know, tourism is down. Uh, so many employees are not working downtown right now. Um, so there's a lot of just like structural factors that really are difficult. Um, there is a new round of the state economic recovery grants coming soon. Um, more businesses will be eligible for that. And then there are some businesses who hit the maximum amount. So you could get up to $150,000 in the last set and that um, they will allow people to reapply for another $150,000. Um, if you'd have to have revenues that were high enough to support that. So it's 10% of 2019 revenues is the maximum grant amount. Um, we have helped Montpelier businesses get approximately $1.9 million in the Vermont Economic Recovery Grants to date. Um, so I'm proud of that. I uh, personally worked with many businesses, spent some time sitting on the computer, helping people fill out applications, if that's what it took. Um, we, uh, Jean Kistner continues to work as our recovery navigator. Um, her, um, she's contracted through March of 2021. Um, she has personally provided assistance to 105 businesses. Um, and then, you know, we've been doing weekly business meetings, a lot of workshops, um, all sorts of, of different ways to help people twice weekly newsletters with, you know, information about grant opportunities and guidelines and other things. Um, in terms of our role, I think the next steps are looking towards um, recruiting some new businesses to our downtown to fill us vacancies that, you know, we've started to see and will unfortunately only see more. Um, and, you know, we continue to do things like promotional campaigns and events and things to get people downtown, um, including Montpelier Madness this weekend, which I would be remiss if I didn't mention. Um, so we see our role as sort of this more um, short and medi um, medium and uh, micro level, and then the MDC's role as the sort of macro strategic planning kind of level, um, and look forward to working with them more. Um, in terms of the DID budget, which is something that I'm actually here to talk about because you have to approve it. So transitioning from thinking about 22 to this is the DID budget for the year that's already started. We're just late in grand tradition. I think it's our every year we tend to come in October to talk to you about a budget that started in July. Um, but making strategic investments in marketing our downtown so that when tourism recovers, we'll be ready for it, including um, revamping our website and creating a new version of our tourism brochure that's been very popular, but will now be out of date. It's now a year and a half old at this point. Um, and uh, continuing, you know, some of the proven strategies that we've used like event grants and, um, you know, keeping our downtown beautiful and welcoming for people. So I'll stop that. Great. Um, questions or comments for Dan? Uh, go ahead, Donna. Um, Dan, when you mentioned you're late, this is FY21. I, I went and looked at our list and I, I saw the development <clears throat> for was listed as something we wanted to at least keep like 25% of the original amount. But I don't see uh, Montpelier Live listed. Are you at all in our FY21 budget? Yes, yeah, yes. And what's so, the amount? 
Um, well, there's a few different line items all within community enhancements. So there's the 32,600 that's sort of the direct unrestricted support. Um, there's some 2,000 for holiday decoration, 3,000 for fall slash winter event. Um, and then the <clears throat> one piece that was cut was $4,500 for July 3rd, which obviously didn't take place this year, although we typically um, use those funds to support that event, but also our organization throughout the year. So that that was the one cut we had, which was about, I guess, 10% of the city appropriation. Um, the DID budget is a separate, um, you know, balloted mm -hmm. line item um, that goes towards downtown marketing and promotion, and that's the sort of specific budget that's in, that's in your packet. And, um, Right, the, but the budget in the packet, both for FY20 and FY21, I don't see any identifiable amount from the city. I see pilot and I see DID as income, but I see nothing from the city direct. Those are the two pieces. So this is just looking at the sort of DID budget specifically, because that's what gets that we what we have to present for approval by council. So the two pieces that go into it are the the DID tax, so that's about forty one thousand, and then the pilot for the properties that are in that DID district, so the state properties that are would otherwise be taxed by the with the special tax assessment, um, which so combined that's about just over sixty thousand dollars. So, the 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 money from the city that goes to Montpelier Live is separate from that. I guess it'd be helpful for me if we got them both at the same time when we're doing our budget, that's all. Just for future reference, okay? Uh, just my own confusion, sorry. Well, the the overall Montpelier Live budget is not, the, our overall budget is not subject mm -hmm. to council approval. Um, I mean, it's publicly available as a nonprofit, but- no, the, no, I understand, but we ultimately do give you these funds. They're not automatic, so I would presume yeah. we'll see some budget related to those funds. The budget related to the funds is what is in the, presented to you. The okay. to related to the DID funds is what's presented to you, and the the remaining money goes towards so that the forty two six hundred what it adds up to the other city funds. The thirty two six hundred basically pays my salary, and then the the other money goes towards those specific things that they're listed for in community enhancement. So, if we had gotten the forty five hundred, it would go towards July third. Um, the 3000 for fall slash winter event is going towards Montpelier Madness, um, and the 2000 for holiday decorations is going to holiday decorations. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess before your time, we used to get this other kind of budget and, and what activities were outside of this. So, sorry, my mind just regressed to wanting to look at that in conjunction with this to see a bigger holistic picture. But thank you. Thank you for explaining that. Any other questions for Dan? Jack, go ahead. So we need a motion to approve the 2001, 2021 yes. DID budget. Yeah. I move that. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Um, further discussion? Any comments from the public? Okay. Um, all right. So all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. All right. So uh, that DID budget passes. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for your time. Thanks for all of the work that you're doing um, with the downtown businesses. And please pass along our thanks to Jean as well. Um, it's really uh, crucial what you all are doing right now. So very grateful. Thanks. Okay. Um, all right. So the next item is a uh, discussion of public bathrooms. And so I think we should take that up next. Uh, the item after to do an update if you wanted to just do those. Yeah. I actually kind of wonder if it makes sense to do those back to back because um, they're related um Bill, so, i could hear what you said would you repeat yourself there, please you said there were some folks on the line from uh montpelier development corporation and so i, I think that that does make sense um so to uh to that i see uh Catherine, you just uh turned your video on i and sarah great um so 
uh, I will turn, and Bill as well. So I will turn things over to you all to give us an update from the MGC. Okay, great. I'll, I'll start with a, just a, a brief introduction and then um, Sarah's going to follow with the mend and, uh, and then uh, Catherine will talk about um, what we've been doing on Savings Pasture. But I think Donna, you brought up a great question and, I, and it's some of this are plans. And once again, we, we offer our, our funds and what we have to the city uh, in these efforts to help with the pandemic and the response. Um, you know, that we, we look at this as a, an issue to solve and, and, and to be supportive in. And, um, you know, I think it, it, some of what we're about to present will depend on whether we actually get funded, um, you know, because without that, we, you know, it probably, if we're not going to get funded going forward, it, it may not make sense for us to kind of try and do start things or, or continue if, um, you know, if we're not, because I do think that the, as Dan described, we are looking at strategic and long-term plans and impacts um, and, and coming up with a plan for that, but it's not, you know, and, and, and it was very helpful that the council funded us and committed to the, to the five years at the beginning. We're now coming up on that fifth year. So it's time to see if there's a commitment and a, and a, um, and, and, and what makes the most sense. And, and I think that we're open to, whatever the council or city, you know, looks at as our, the best utilization of both our funds and, and our kind of human resources. Um, we now have seven people on the board and um, you get all of us for free. Uh, we spend all of our money on direct, uh, you know, kind of direct impact. Everyone on the board is very, very budget conscious and, um, You'll see, you know, last we were before you, we talked about the MEND fund um, and you'll hear how much we've, we, you know, that, that, that was raised for the MEND fund and the impact and how broadly that, that hit. I think also uh, when the, in, when COVID first came, uh, you know, and, and impacted our economy, we, uh, we offered uh, several grants and, and, um, Montpelier Live did take one of those grants, and that's that was the original funding for um, the Navigator, the Gene Kistner money. Uh, it contributed; it's not all of it, but uh, we we and then think feeling like there was more uh, to be done in the immediate sense, um, we did come up with the with the Men Fund. So I think with that, we'll uh, Sarah will talk about Men, and then. There's ongoing work kind of in that longer term, you know, kind of continuing to plan for the future and, and growth uh, right through this whole pandemic. Um, we'll talk about Savings Pasture as well. And then we can shift back to, at the end, if there's time, our long-term plan, which would depend on kind of funding and, and what that looks like, but using the pandemic and, and looking nationally at what's happening and saying that Montpelier may be one of those economic um, solutions to uh, the problems that, that, that people are seeing in the cities. And I think we're seeing, anecdotally, we're seeing some evidence of that. We've started to actually come up with some, some data uh, that, that Montpelier is, is a refuge uh, for people looking to leave cities and, and, and places of high creativity. So we're, we're looking at Brooklyn and, and Portland, Oregon as places that are already by natural causes coming here. So we would be working in conjunction with what Dan was talking about earlier, um, but on that long-term range and, and high impact, trying to really leverage our dollars and bring people here from afar. Uh, but with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Sarah and we can talk about efforts that we've done and, and completed. Great. Thanks, Bill. Um, and thanks to all of you for your long hours and hearing, hearing the budget numbers is really, um, I'm 
you know, I don't envy you. I've, as you know, I've been in your seats, and uh, especially you, Anne, don't envy you. I feel, feel uh, some responsibility for you being on the council. So thank you all, really, for your hard work and difficult decisions ahead of you. Um, so I have the opportunity to talk about something, you know, fantastic, which is reporting on this great fundraising effort that we were part of, um, where we provided grants to 74 Montpelier businesses um, in the downtown. They ranged from $1,000 to $5,000. Collectively, the corporate donors that we were working with, um, Union Mutual, the company I work for, Vermont Mutual, National Life, North Oak Savings Bank, um, Noel W. Johnson, and then a bunch of under individual donors, um, in, uh, including Susan Ritz, who we all know is a great community steward and benefactor. Um, the total contribution for all those entities and people was over $200,000. So that was a great infusion of cash um, into our community in the summer. And we had an amazing reception to that. As you can imagine, quite a bit of gratitude and appreciation. Um, I had a chance to speak one-on-one -on -one with a lot of downtown business owners who were just, you know, Cheerful in their appreciation, and it was, you know, really, we were pleased to be part of that. Montpelier Foundation acted as our fiscal agent, so they were responsible for the logistics and the actual check cutting. Um, so that was that was really a, a pleasure to be a part of, um, and obviously just a small part of the recovery efforts, getting people through, um, you know, sort of the the beginning of this. Um, so we're, uh, we are, we have, we are in conversations with Montpelier Alive about some next steps about COVID recovery. We have, uh, more meetings scheduled with them about, um, working on them, working with them, sorry, um, on new business attraction. But again, as Bill, Bill said that that will sort of depend on what, frankly, what you want from us in the future. We're, we're, uh, we would like to be certainly working with you and for you um, and are very cognizant of the pressures that you're under financially. So would like to be able to be part of that solution in terms of what our local business community, um, who, you know, who it is made up of and, and how it survives. But, um, you know, again, we'll, we'll, we'll defer to your, your difficult decisions. So um, I'll hand it over to Catherine Codius, who has been, working for the MDC as a project manager. She's, she was the administrative um, steward and superhero of the MEND Fund and is working with us also as a project manager um, on a couple other projects, including Sabin's Pasture. So I'll let her take it from here. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. And it's nice to meet all of you who I've not met, but I think I know most of you. It's nice to see your faces. Um, so, I've been, um, as these guys mentioned, project managing the Savings Pasture Development, which at this point has been a lot of monitoring. Um, essentially, MDC has been tracking progress on two potential major developments um, in the Savings Parcel area. And rather than talk about the specifics of those projects, I'll just share with you sort of our role. Um, we've been meeting weekly with um, Bill, I've been meet, meeting weekly with Bill Frazier and um, the city's TIF consultant. Um, and earlier this summer, we convened stakeholders um, from both projects to look for points of collaboration on infrastructure to better leverage um, the TIF, um, of the potential TIF um, for that area. Um, mixed success here um, in terms of uh, working with those parties, uh, but I think that we're MDC is still working um, in various directions to facilitate the best use of potential funds that could come from these developments um, to benefit the city and the public. Uh, so we, moving forward, hope to identify pinch points for developers um, in the area and to look for solutions for them. Um, we'll continue to promote uh, housing development and other city goals that are tied to these projects um, and really hoping, you know, focusing on leveraging local, state, federal dollars, um, really with the high aim of, you know, looking for the public benefit of these projects, but also to attract new um, residents and towns, uh, residents and uh, businesses to town. Um, so that's kind of the like really high level of, of what we've been doing. And I'm, I'm ha happy to answer more specifics. Um, 
but I'm sure you guys probably know way more than you ever wanted to know about potential things that could potentially happen at Savings Faster. Great. Uh, any questions uh, for any of the NBC folks? Uh, Jay, go ahead. Uh, a little bit random, but Eleanor, what do, what do you think should be the next steps for MDC? Thanks for joining us, by the way. I'm happy to be there, at least uh, virtually with you all. I'm, a, I'm in the nation's capital at this point. Um, not close to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, however, just to make that clear. Um, we were talking today about some very exciting things that um, we could perhaps um, contribute going forward in this, in this crisis. And I'd rather defer to Bill to talk about it now, or maybe we need to talk internally first for a while and then get back to you. But I think we do have a role. I mean, I think that what happened with the MEND fund um, I just think was extraordinary and I, I it was it was several of the MDC board members who put that together, obviously, and um, it was it was a tremendous contribution. I mean, I, again, anecdotally talked to a number of the business owners, and they were thrilled as Sarah was saying, I mean, they were almost tearful about how, how much the small relatively small amount that we were able to contribute helped them to keep their doors open. And that was very exciting. And so I, I do think we have a role. I think the kind of role that we can play is something very, very specific, like what's going on on Sabins. I mean, keeping an eye on, on the different parties there, keeping an eye on potential ways that we could suggest to the city to support whatever development happens there. And, and also working to attract businesses that perhaps are going to be leaving the cities and uh, you know I, I'm a city person I love being in in big cities New York and and Washington etc but I do think that clearly in the residential realm we have seen that people want to come to Vermont They're, the residential market from what I know is absolutely booming um, unlike other parts of the world and I think this could perhaps perhaps happen with businesses as well those that don't have to be in a city could perhaps be doing back of the office work in Montpelier could perhaps be doing light manufacturing, all sorts of things, which again would bring more people downtown if we can fill the upper levels of our buildings and um, would bring more business to our, our retailers. So that's a few thoughts. No, I appreciate it. I don't mean to just put you on the spot, but I'm, I appreciate you joining us and just curious, curious your perspective, so. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. And and the MEND project was really exciting. So thanks for all the work that went into that. Really appreciate it. Um, have you seen it all, you know, knowing that a lot of our philanthropic dollars right now are going to COVID relief and response, the community found Vermont Community Foundation has done, you know, a, a big shift there. Is there an opportunity to get funding for the role MDC is playing from some philanthropic dollars that are looking at recovery and response, you know, like new opportunities that haven't been there before that might be able to, you know, knowing the budget pressures, the city, as you just sat through our <laughs> dire um, forecasts, um, just wondering if there's other paths that are kind of new um, opportunities that, and if you're looking into that. Um, I think the short answer is no. Uh, we haven't looked into that in the in the sense that um, going to the to the community foundation or 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 others. Uh, Bill Fraser and I did talk about uh, you know the idea of going for more grants and things like that. So that's that's certainly something that we can do. Um, no one on our board is necessarily a um, specialist in that area in grant writing and. Um, we have some funding we can put towards that. I think that there is, uh, just in that one instance though, um, if you look at the amount of money that um, uh, was given to MDC this year, it was $75,000. The fact that we raised uh, a good chunk over 200,000 and put it right directly into the community and, and additionally funded that effort so that every dollar contributed 
was a dollar given to a um, a business. You know, we funded all the administrative um, costs and all the production and 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 all of that out of our our savings. And we still have some savings to keep working and and moving um, things forward. I, so I, I I think that our goal and as, as a group, um, we're best put at taking the dollars that we have and leveraging them towards these efforts and and making direct deposits into the community as opposed to really becoming a administrative heavy organization where we have a you know a development person and a grant writer and and all of those things that that isn't really the direction we chose to go uh we went with a lean and and direct um structure where we just hire per job per you know as a as a project manager base and it's it's been very effective and we've been able to conserve our funds and and um, really leverage that i do hear what you're saying and and we're not saying no to that i think we'll we'll look for funding but i think that there are many um towns and organizations looking for that funding uh similarly so my guess is that a group that isn't well practiced in that isn't going to be super successful you know we're, we don't have a history of grant writing or or, or grant administration so but just just to add to that though bill is that we we did um early in the summer um actually retain a lobbying firm to spend some time and energy lobbying the legislature to try to funnel uh recovery funds to montpelier specifically and then other designated downtowns as well so we we have made some significant efforts to to do that there was you know there's always a lot of legislative yeah. process of course but we did try spend some resource to, to, to do what we can to get to get funds towards this community that's true that's a good point i didn't look at that as as this in the same category but that's right we spent um quite a bit and we didn't just look at montpelier we actually funded an entire statewide effort to bring funding to designated downtowns um so you know that's those are the kinds of things we are doing and I, we should have mentioned that uh, you know i think that there's a lot that everybody on this board is doing in addition to all their other work. Uh, and there isn't a person here to, that doesn't work as hard as they can for uh, Montpelier when uh, we have our board meetings and everything else. I mean, you know, the enthusiasm is high and the belief is strong that we can have uh, continue to high, have a high impact. If you wish. <laughs> Any other comments or questions uh, for the MDC crew? Okay. Uh, well, thank you again so much for all of your, the time that you've uh, given your energy and enthusiasm uh, from Montpelier. Thanks for um, all your work with the, the MEN Fund and uh, you know just all the efforts that you have uh, put forward on behalf of the, the businesses and residents of Montpelier. We're really, we're very grateful. Um, uh, we're, we're thankful for you. I, watching tonight, we, you know, it's amazing yeah. what you all are doing. It's incredible. It really is. So hang in there. And we will support you however you ask. Great. Well, thank you so much. Your time. All right. Take Indeed. Care. Yeah. All right. Have a good evening. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. So we're at 937. I am inclined to not punt anything, which I think is going to take us past 10. Are you okay with that? unless you want to punch something. Okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. So we're gonna keep going. Um, right, the next item is talking about uh, public restrooms. And for this, I'm gonna turn things over to Cameron. Thank you. Um, I'd like to walk through my memo. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, the Chief um, Gowans, the Chief Vegas, that's funny. Uh, Chief Gallons with the Fire Department, DPW, and the Parks Department, and the Homelessness Task Force for helping me with this memo and getting this research and information together. Um, generally, I wanted to step through an overview of the situation. Um, since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the City of Montpelier has had few open 24-hour restroom facilities available to residents and visitors. This is not a direct outcome 
of the pandemic that's exclusive to Montpelier or even Vermont. This is countrywide and once open public facilities have closed. This really does impact quite a lot of folks and the need outweighs the available resources all over our nation. City staff has asked to look into options, both short and long term, to address this need in our community. So we took efforts to get rough estimates for creating permanent restrooms, uh, including uh, to begin work expanding the city's use of Portage on units and expanding our understanding of what is available, uh, what available facilities are already in existence in the city. You've already heard the budget update. I want to make it very clear that these possible projects are all presented with the understanding that our city budget is at a historic shortfall and that we've been trying very hard to get uh, required funding um, through other means other than the city budget. But we do know that these lack of restrooms is a holistic issue and need, we are, really do want to support um, this if this effort, but do understand that it, it requires sort of a holistic community approach as well. So the first part of our work included getting the current restroom location and hours that we know of. So we collected information about local places that are currently open. We also reached out to the state to learn more about their facilities to see if they could open any of their doors, any of their buildings, uh, which we were told no. Uh, because they're really also suffering from a lack of staff. They don't have their cleaning staff in the buildings uh, because they don't have staff in the buildings. So they don't, they don't have that available to them. So um, I also did not include places on this list that have high barriers for restroom use, such as purchase requirements. Some of our gas stations, et cetera, are open very late, but do require purchase to use. So I did not include those. I have a list of our current available restroom locations that I know of. This list is probably not exhaustive, but it was a group effort to pull together right now. Uh, the Vermont History Museum is open days and set through Saturdays, 10 to 4. The Keller Hubbard Library is open for specific hours. City Hall is open specific hours. Cumberland Farms Gas Station on Berlin Street is open 24 hours. We were told that it does not require purchase for use of bathrooms. We do have a few 24 seven accessible portage on units. The city maintains two currently. Um, I will get into this a little bit later, but we have the potential for a third unit. Uh, location is to be determined, sponsored by the local nonprofit Just Basics. They did just give us a, their board approved funding to help us get another unit. Uh, we did talk to the state about unlocking their two units that are available right to the left of the state house lawn. Uh, those uh, we've tested them, they are currently unlocked. And then um, council member Jack McCullough mentioned that there's an offer from BSECU that may, they may have an additional portage on unit, but that's unconfirmed at this time. So that's really where we focus our efforts is to supply the community with more portage ons. Um, we have been in active discussion with multiple local partners to expand the number of Porta John units available. I don't want to call out specifically the folks that we're working with now because I don't know if that's confirmed and I don't want to put any pressure on them. Um, but we are working with a few. So our goal is to partner with them uh, that are not in the floodplain, which does become an issue in downtown Montpelier, to put accessible Porta John units in parking lots. We can either pay for and maintain them or we can get help and support from local agencies. Again, like I said, Just Basics, a nonprofit here that normally does food supply, um, approved a one-time $5,000 expense to sponsor a Porter John unit until the spring. Uh, location and timeline is to be determined. We're trying to figure out with our street outreach workers what would be the best place to put that. So we're also working pretty hard to create sort of a sponsorship campaign Again, trying to get folks to help us uh, facilitate getting more units for people. That includes things like hand washing stations as well. Um, so it's not just restrooms. There's a couple other options that do cost uh, funding or cost money, uh, including uh, reopening the 24 seven police department restroom. 
until City Hall is open 24 or is open on a normal schedule, the police department has hesitations in opening up that space. Uh, we really cannot risk our officers at this point or our public um, safety staff. So normally the lobby bathroom is available at all hours by request. Um, I realized that my memo doesn't go into the, uh, I stopped a sentence there. I don't know why. So I will go in and fix that and resend that. But opening the PD restroom does require um, uh, a small amount of funds, but funds nonetheless to hire a cleaner. We don't have enough cleaning staff right now for the capacity of a 24 seven bathroom. We'd also need to create a barricade of some variety to keep folks from wandering into our public dispatch area just for safety concerns. So we're also trying to work very hard with local organizations to increase the amount of open restrooms. Besides reaching out to the state, we have begun permitting discussions with both Another Way and Good Sam, two groups that work with those experiencing homelessness to expand our restroom options in town. Good Samaritan has begun the permitting process regarding opening a winter overflow shelter at Christ Church, which would provide one accessible restroom and two non-accessible restrooms to our community inventory. I do believe that would be for folks who are staying in the shelter. So there's some long-term projects that we looked into and we priced out. Again, these would be funding dependent um, if you did want to go investigate any of them. Um, but we do have a current grant open with another way in Washington County Mental Health I wanted you to be aware of. It's a $700,000 grant that has some funding going to another way to add expanded restroom and shower facilities along with a uh, laundry room. This work is delayed slightly due to state environmental impacts, but another way is working through those and that grant has been approved and funded. So I did look into some uh, interesting toilet options, such as the Portland Lou, which is used in Portland, Oregon. Um, that is on average $141,000 for installation and uh, that does not include shipping because that is a very specific type of standalone toilet that they use in their parks there. Um, we also looked at the renovation of the information kiosk at 60 State Street. Um, we estimated that at about a twenty dollars to $35,000 effort to uh, install and connect to utilities. Um, we also looked into the option of a I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but it's a toilet type that incinerates waste. Um, so it doesn't have to connect to utilities. Um, but again, that would also need to be a renovation of that space, but that does cut uh, the cost quite a lot. But those are very specific um, types of toilets that we don't have the expertise to maintain. So we do have to think about that as well. But we did, but we did look into those options. Um, we also looked into upfitting City Hall. Um, that was a cheaper option as well, along with the incinerator toilets. Um, probably we got it uh, off the back of a napkin estimate around five to $10,000 for upfits, which would include gates um, to make sure that people couldn't get up into our third floor or second floor, but still maintaining, um, you know, ADA accessibility with our elevator because there's no way to get down there without walking down the stairs. We'd also need to uh, install a new security camera so that our dispatch center could see that space. Uh, there are some safety concerns with those restrooms, uh, the way that they're situated and in a small hallway, there have been uh, multiple reports of loitering and assaults in those bathrooms. Um, that is just a small safety concern. We're not trying to say that it's not possible. We just wanted to give you all that information. We also looked at composting toilets that we use in the park system. Those usually cost around $10,000. Uh, there are some issues with those as well. Um, normally they're supposed to work on a 10 year timeline, but those that have high traffic fill up pretty quickly. And so they don't actually decompose like they're supposed to. So we have to pay a pretty high price to get those cleaned out because they don't have the time that they're supposed to be, they're supposed to sit for five years and they're normally, um, the parks department says they're emptied out about 1.5 years. Um, also there, it has a significant impact to our staff 
as uh, people inevitably throw non-organics into those toilets and we actually have to fish those out. Um, but if that is determined as a viable possibility, we have identified two potential locations for a composting toilet, uh, one in Blanchard Park and one in the State House Path, but that would need to be in partnership with the city, or I apologize, the state, as it is their land. Then we also wanted to point out that this, none of these things are off the table because we are looking for alternative funding opportunities. We've already know that in February, 2021, the community development program will be re-releasing their grant opportunity, which does uh, often fund capital projects, which a lot of grants don't. So we will be looking into that um, as an option for one of these proposals in the future. Um, my recommendation is really um, continuing to help um, get more portable like Porta John units out there. I know they're not the best option, um, but they're the one that we can afford right now because there's a lot of community support for them. Um, and I, I just want to say again that I appreciate all the support we've been getting from our local nonprofits and our businesses who have been willing to talk to us about that. I also think that with those, with our, um, our uh, understanding of what is out there for use of restrooms and working with our street outreach professionals that people will be able to locate um, those 24 hour access accessible places such as the uh, Porta Johns and Cumberland Farms and really add that to, to their resources that they know about. Uh, I know it's not the best answer. It's just the answer that I think we have right now. So that that's the whole of my memo. Great. Do you have Thank any you. questions? Donna, go ahead. It's a wonderful report. It just is so expansive. I, I, the whole, I love it. Thank you. Thank you. And if we could just get things posted that you know about mm -hmm. and that you got the state to unlock their porty pots. Whoa. I don't know how often they're unlocked, but to see them unlocked once has never happened to me. And I'm there a lot at one of their picnic tables. So kudos. Kudos, really. Um, I'll shout out Chief Gowans again. He was the one who had the conversations with the state. Yes, and, 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 and it's good of you to mention, yes, we need hand washing also. So this has some really great short-term and long-term proposals. Thank you. Just thank you very much. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Uh, Jack, go ahead. I think, thanks, Karen. I think this is great. I, I should point out that I got uh, the idea of the State Employees Credit Union came up because I was walking my wife's dog the other day and I noticed that uh, they had construction going on over there and they had a, a porta potty there for the construction. So I contacted a friend of mine who's on their board and said, hey, can we, is there any way we can just get the credit union to keep that there and keep it open, uh, at least through the winter for people who need it? Um, and it's I'm not sure they're jumping on that, but they're definitely expressing uh, an interest in in being part of this effort. And uh, and so I I think I forwarded that memo to uh, to you, Cameron. I think that has a uh, it has potential for being uh, really being part of the solution. Um, I like the idea of. Uh, oh, let me start another way. Do you know how much the uh, estimated cost of doing the uh, the police department uh, bathroom would be? I do not. Um, I don't have an estimate from a cleaner uh, right now. That that we weren't able to turn around. And I don't want to misquote uh, what that cost is right now. Um, so that I don't have yet. Because that seems like a another pretty promising uh, option because it's a, it's it's in an already existing facility, doesn't have some of the same uh, security issues that the city hall bathroom does. And so I, I'd be interested in seeing us move forward on trying to make that happen. We'll try to be more robust about asking for quotes. No criticism intended, of course. Oh, it's fine. Thank you. 
Um, before Donna goes, any other city councilor have something they want to say? Uh, go ahead, Dan. So, uh, you know, I, I appreciate the memo as well. I think it collects this information um, that's badly needed. Uh, a couple of issues strike me as uh, relevant. One is, I don't, I was thinking about this, and I don't know if we have a metric for demand. Um, you know, what what is the need for bathrooms? I mean, we all agree that there's a need out there, um, but I'm struggling to, to understand what that metric looks like. And, you know, I think when we talked about this before, we're really talking about two potential, uh, two to three groups of people that are likely to use it or that we're aiming towards, which would be, obviously there's a, there's a homeless population that needs um, this resource um, and that we're starting to see with some of the letters that we've received from the transit center people uh, that it's starting to have an impact on other people. Um, but there's also the idea of tourists and um, you know, people who happen to be downtown with a need. Um, but I, it just strikes me that I, I'd like to have a better sense about what this need really and truly looks like. Um, because I think that <coughs> may drive what we're, what we're thinking about. Because what, what seems to be establishing is, you know, if we have a porta potty at VSCCU, two at the State House, if we were able to open up the police station, if we were able, you know, and there were the two continuing the two porta potties, you know, by City Hall, as well as the Cumberland Farms, you know, what, what do those numbers look like? And are we still not having, an, are we still having an issue or not issue with meeting that need? Um, it also oh, struck me. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Well, I wanted to respond to that. Um, so I apologize if I cut you off. I think, um, first off, we're getting some reports from our street outreach workers and our, um, you know, Im embedded clinician in the police department of a real need after hours for a lot of folks who are on the street. And um, that's one, that's one um, and really valid and important demographic that we're trying to get here. Um, but also, you know, I hear, and it's just in the year I've been here, I hear almost every time there's a farmer's market, why isn't there a porta john at the farmer's market? Why isn't there a toilet for me to use at the farmer's market? A lot of those places downtown aren't open on Saturdays, except businesses who may not have an open and available restroom for the public. So this is just for me hearing it anecdotally. And that is a problem that most of this data is anecdotal, if you will. But I, I think if you uh, sort of look outside of Montpelier itself, this has been a, a national trend that, you know, public restrooms really are needed. If you think about the folks who may have a medical concern that can't wait or hold it for as long as they might be able to get home. I, I think it's a it's part of being a welcoming and open community. Um, so data, real hard data or not, I think it's an important goal to strive for, even through grant funding, if, if that's, because that isn't something that I'd like to stop working on for sure. Right. Well, it just it just strikes me that that that, that seems to be the missing piece of this, this puzzle or the next piece that we, as we as we think about these, because I, you know, if I think about how, how this is, you know, what, what we're trying to put together is can we piece together a short term solution to deal with an immediate problem um, where we can, where we can say, you know, we have five, six, seven places where people can go uh, to use the restroom and X number of them available after hours of 24 seven. Um, in locations that make sense. But then, you know, I think that then shapes how we think about this long term and then what kind of resources we want to either think about what we have to put behind this solution or, um, you know, how, how we think about it. Because I was thinking about the last time we talked about it when I was proposing, you know, sort of that Tokyo toilet model. And, and I think one of the fair criticisms of that is, well, we may not need it in one spot. We may need it in three spots, and we, you know, we may need um, we may need to think differently about it. And I think that's 
that's fair, but I think that's really driven in part by figuring out what this need looks like. Um, let's go uh, Lauren and then Donna, and then I, I suspect there may be some comments from the public. Yeah, just, just two quick thoughts, kind of piggybacking on Dan's point of, you know, who are the populations we're trying to serve here. Um, one, I do think, you know, we brought up before when we've talked about the police department as an option. I think that does not, you know, certain populations I think will not use that. So we should just know that that could serve some functions, but I think it's, you know, it would not meet other people's needs. So we should just be aware of that if that was going to be part of it and part of our investment. Um, and then just thinking about kind of the locations where right now, even like signage, I, I don't know how people would even know if you come to town, like these are all kind of hidden or you wouldn't necessarily know where to find them or, or how to look for them. So some of it to, to the point of, you know, now that you've done all this great uh, work compiling some information, some of which I think is new to, to me, certainly, um, you know, how do we let people know this in a way and even visitors, you know, is there some way of providing clear signage if you're downtown and that there are actually um, places where you can go if you need to. So just something else to think about. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Donna. Uh, thank you. I wanted to go back to Cameron's um, statement about all the Porty Johns. Is there cleaning included on the ones we have and like Vermont State Employees Credit Union, are they going to maintain it and keep it clean? Because that makes a big difference. And as I, as you all know, I picnic almost every lunchtime by the state house. It's great to see people. And those porty pots are never open. And the Law Station Theater had an event that they arranged and got approved on the state house lawn. But they would not open those porty pots for them. They had to rent their own porty pots. I mean, they were willing to pay the state to use theirs, but they had to rent another one. So I hope you really make some progress with them. But tourists, after tourists would come up to me, especially at the picnic table at 133 and say, do you know if the state office building is open? I mean, restaurants don't let you eat there, those who started eating in, unless you're eating there. Most of them are going to move to takeout once we, many of them may move to takeout once we close in for the winter. Uh, so bathrooms, even the ones that you assume aren't available to people. I know I time myself how long I can be gone from home by my bladder. <laughs> it's like, okay, I better do this and get back in two hours. Or I stop at City Hall on the right day, but I can't use the police department anymore. So, I mean, it's a real issue just for everyday people shopping and doing things. Um, it's just amazing. But for tourists this fall, it was, and all through the summer, it was really bad. I mean, I just never was on the street without somebody asking me for a bathroom. I wish I kept the data, Dan, because it was just incredible. And I couldn't refer them to any place once the police department closed. I used to send people there. Um, so, and posting. So when we do know that there's some open, we really need to publish it for our people so they can share with everybody they see on the street uh, to know where they're at. I mean, it's a real issue. I really, uh, one thing I liked about the Portland Lou that was uh, part of this report was it reminded me of all the public bathrooms in Europe. I mean, you may have to pay 35 cents, but there was always a bathroom available within a relatively walking distance. And I would like us to move towards that when we have the resources to do so. That's all. And getting them clean. It's really important to keep them clean. I did want to address the, your question at the beginning about cleaning. Uh, the city is paying for extra cleaning for the two that we monitor, and that is the level that we want to have people sponsor it at. I love the idea of having a, having sponsored uh, porta potties. It's really interesting. Um, well, okay. I've heard too that having recently to a few places uh, attract tourists. Um, I see porta potties all over the place that I never used to see. It seems to me that is what people are doing now, uh, you know, in in these circumstances. So, uh, 
you know, it's not, it isn't the most desirable, but it seems to be where places are, are going that are attracting lots of people and, and in cities and tourist locations and everything else. So just, a, just a, again, a non-scientific observation. All the state rest, rest stops have it now. Okay. Um, yeah. Before we go to Dan, uh, comments from the public. Yes, Madam Mayor, Stephen Whitaker. Go ahead, Stephen. Uh, porta potties uh, don't cut it by any stretch. Um, you know, I don't think, Donna, you're going to welcome anybody coming out of the porta potty knowing there's no hand washing to join your picnic. Um, just the whole idea that we're in a pandemic seems to be lost on this conversation. I've been raising this conversation for a solid year, and some of you tell me it's, this is the first you're hearing about it. Um, city center used to be the primary public bathroom. Everybody knew the code. Uh, and Orca was there as well, which was a, a secondary public bathroom. Um, we, we have, we really need to address this in an entirely different way, not, uh, publishing other bathrooms that are, we're going to soon be overloaded and then re create a reaction of, of closure. Uh, we really need to tackle this in a comprehensive, take uh, the low hanging fruit, which is clearly city hall, basement bathrooms, rear entrance, and transit center. Grab the low hanging fruit that we have immediate control over and deal with the cleaning issues, deal with the security and the video issues. Uh, as uh, Cameron pointed out, or Donna pointed out, people are not gonna, many people on the street are not gonna wanna go in the police station. And the police station doesn't really want them there. They, they, they've made that clear. Uh, they, I, I, I saved a no trespass notice. They uh, had served on one of the homeless, you know, persons. Uh, I thought it was fascinating that this person, who's most likely to need the police, has a no trespass order to go to the police. <laughs> so this, this is how discombobulated this whole thing is. Uh, Porta potties are ex example. Uh, perfect example of the lack of dignity we show both both our homeless and our tourists. Um, in a pandemic, you need hot wash, hot washing, hand washing. Um, we could have negotiated at a time with city center before Necky moved out. We missed that opportunity. Uh, that was the subject of one of the public records requests, which has still not been addressed with, with uh, that you've been lied to about, that when there were permit conditions that numerous people in town, even people who worked on that building, there were permit conditions assigned to that, those public restrooms being available, and they were lost or hidden or, uh, you know, slipped in between the wrong file. Um, but that's, that's a different problem. Uh, permanent public restrooms, uh, need to be part of a plan, should be a design competition, possibly. You know, the city would be well uh, wise to invest a few thousand dollars in getting somebody like Ward Joyce just to go and, and come up with a plan of where the least cost. Uh, the 60 State Street location will require plumbing for washing, even if you were to do an incinerating toilet there. Um, so, we, there are no inexpensive options other than what already exists. We should try to negotiate with landlords of vacant properties that have plumbing in them and make even a six month or a 12 month uh, agreement to use and clean those, those restrooms. But this is, this is a public health emergency. And for y'all to say, oh, the, you know, porta potties are fine. Well, I've been telling you for six months that people are crapping in the alleys and behind in the church gardens. So it's, it's hard for me to maintain a calm and, uh, you know, convivial conversation full tone about this when you've neglected the emergency for far too long. And uh, I would encourage you to deal with the low hanging fruit no one's going to walk to Cumberland Farms, and I would be, you know, I wouldn't even tell one of the little ladies on the street out walking where to find a bathroom. Oh, yeah, go across the river and down the block about a quarter mile, and you'll find a gas station. It's like, it's absurd. Y'all are really, um, 
not taking the appropriate leadership on this. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Dan. Well, I had uh, a question actually about the um, the porta potties and the expense, which is, uh, and I I don't know if this is even at all feasible, um, but it just struck me that some of the cost, obviously, of these porta potties is that they have to be maintained um, and disposed of the contents that are cleaned out. Um, is there any capacity in the city to take over any of that given our sewer treatment plant? Um, so that so the, the they're owned by Wind River and we're not supposed to do anything with them. No, I understand obviously the ones we rent there, we, we, we wouldn't be able to, but is there um, any possibility as a, as a sort of way of trying to drive that service in house and possibly bring the cost down or is that? Uh, so you're, saying that you'd want DPW to buy and service their own? Yes, to the extent that, you know, with the with the sewer plant. Um, I, I would hesitate to say yes in because of the fact that it's a pretty specific type of equipment that they use to clean that out. And then we would have to buy that type of specific equipment, which would then defeat the purpose of cost savings that that probably answers my question it just it just occurred to me as we were talking <laughs> about that um you know what that what that option would even look like right. um we'd also know, be able to clean the equipment in-house either we'd have to outsource that as well right i i think sort of shifting off of that uh, the hairball idea um which uh, you know, one of the problems I think with the Portland Blue is is that it it seemed to be an outdoor um, bathroom, and that it you know it had mesh. It did not have. I would wonder how it would function in a, a cold winter environment, um, and it didn't seem to have a sink either. Um, the sink is on the outside of the Portland Blue. Okay, um, because I think if we're thinking about um long-term solutions for this uh, um you know obviously we are talking about running water hot water soap um and and a toilet um as the functional parts of this uh, i would i would share the the sort of misgivings about the city hall bathroom um in the basement it seems like that's a security risk um i think that creates a situation that's not safe for um, people using it. It also creates an unnecessary situation that the city might have to become involved because we own that property um, and the potential liability. Um, you know, I think, you know, as, as, as not great as porta bodies are, um, you know, they seem to be the way we're going to get across the finish line with this, um, with this problem. And, you know, we have to recognize as well um, that there's, you know, there, part of trying to understand this is, you know, we're setting up sort of the, the basic basement threshold of what, if someone came into the city without any resources, what would be their facility? Um, whereas when we think about, uh, you know, the different populations this might serve, there are going to be people that will be able to go into uh, a facility make a purchase and use their restroom. Um, you know, uh, the the you know the tourist or the um, the resident who finds themselves downtown can can afford to buy the package of gum that gets them admission to the to the bathroom. Um, so I think it, it it's really going to come down to what what the population looks like. But I, I guess I'll beat the drum that I beat before, which is that. I think we have to think about this as an opportunity to create something that is lasting when we think about the final next chapter solution um, and the long-term solution of how we create public facilities. Um, and they should be facilities that are sustainable, but also facilities that we have a certain amount of pride in, in the city and having those bathrooms public bathrooms as, as something that, you know, like the European bathrooms are um, 
not things that are hidden in corners, but that are readily findable and um, are worth worth looking at on the outside um, from an architectural point of view, from um, a cityscape point of view. You know, I just building off of that, I, um, if this was a normal fiscal year, I would be very interested in the prospect of converting that information booth that's right downtown uh, to a bathroom for twenty to thirty-five thousand dollars. That you know, again, in a normal fiscal year, that would feel doable to me, even if it's a hundred percent off and it's you know seventy thousand dollars. That that still might be worth it. Having said that, this is not a normal fiscal year, um, so I don't really know where that leaves us. Um, for that and I don't know where that leaves us even for some of the the short-term solutions it sounds like we've got um, some basically like emergency need um, solutions in the porta potties and that is you know that's that's what we've got right now um, and I think we'll probably just have to um, I mean I think this could be one of the things that is on the table that we discuss uh, alongside other budget considerations, but you know we'll just have to see where where it lands. Um, and I don't think there's any other action that we necessarily need to take this evening on this. Um, Lauren and Dan, I see you have uh, comments, uh, and then I, I think I'm anticipating that we're going to move on. So Lauren, go ahead. Yes, just really quickly, just seeing all in one place the um, the hours and stuff that various. Um, public restrooms are open through the community. Just I know the issue's been raised before about like having running water and being able to clean yourself in a different way. Um, so, you know, making sure our street outreach uh, worker has that nice list that you compiled, you know, so that people, you know, again, all of this is not ideal and in this terrible, you know, budget situation, uh, but making sure that at least what is available, people, um, you know, it's getting into the right hands so people might not realize all the, you know, library has their windows, the store, <laughs> you know, all of that. So anyway, I think that's a great resource you put together and hopefully it can uh, Thank help you. with some of the emergency response. Our, our, the Good Samaritan Street Outreach worker, uh, Dawn Little, who you've spoken to and is on the Homelessness Task Force, helped me put this list together. And so she has it and is aware of it. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And Dan, go ahead. Sorry, I, I just had three things that I think might merit, um, not necessarily emotion, but some some action. One is, I think this question about population strikes me as a homelessness task force item to, to identify what what is the population look like and what is the need for. We we have numbers. Okay, but I mean, does it match up to the need? I mean, is is that? Well, that's where we're getting the reports of the need is from the homelessness task force, from our street outreach workers and our embedded clinician. We have right now because the state is still holding people in the hotels, holding people is the wrong word, uh, allowing people to stay in the hotels through our general voucher um, system that is in place. Um, our population has swelled because of that, but the population on the street is still relatively low um, and, and stable. I say relatively low because it's not low. Anyone who's on the street is pretty high number. So anywhere between 20, 30 people right now actively is what I'm being told. Um, but that, but the, the 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 issue mainly is location, not necessarily. Uh, so I, that's the the number that we have. Right. I, I guess I guess it's it's a matter of like matching up with like location as well as you know. I, I mean I don't know what a what one if you know if you have if you have ten ten people you know in a particular area. What does that translate to as far as need for facilities? Does that mean one port body, two port bodies, or you know, I guess that's what I'm looking for as as we continue this conversation. Uh, and then, so I, I, that just strikes me. I don't know if there if the task force would be willing to to tackle that kind of question, but it just seems to me that's the data we're we're needing. Um, the other piece of information that might might help. Um, is also the bathrooms that you've listed. Um, how many have, do we, where are the sort of hand washing elements to it? You know, um, sanitizer versus actual running water. And then I'm, I'm wondering if, 
the third thing I was thinking about is whether Montpelier are alive or another group would be able to give us any sense about, you know, sort of visitor need, um, you know, what those, what those numbers look like. I'm muted. I apologize. Um, so OSHA's recommendations for Porta John numbers is, I think, a good uh, ballpark, and I'll just read that. Um, one toilet for 20 employees or less. So one per 20 folk. And the ones we have now have hand sanitizer that's restocked twice a week, but I don't believe that they have running water options. I will say that I don't want to throw out too many hypotheticals because that can get a lot of folks hopes up, but we are talking to some folks at the state about maybe getting uh, FEMA um, uh, type restroom facilities, which are those Red Cross larger ones that have shower facilities. And I, I said, I don't really like talking about potentials because they are that, they are potentials. And I don't want us to get excited about something that might not could happen, but that is we understand that that's a need and we're trying to get low cost, no cost options for help to get us there. Great. Uh, Madam Mayor, can I offer uh, closing insight on this? Um, well, I, actually, I think there may be a couple other comments. It's not necessarily closing, but if you'd like to jump in now is okay. And then we'll go Jack. And then I think we have one other person who might want to comment. Okay. Um, so go ahead, Stephen. With regards to the uh, portable trailer type, I've mentioned that before. I mentioned it at the Homeless Task Force. The time is now to put any plans together. The main thing about citing a toilet trailer or a sh shower trailer is they need the, is the siting. They, they can be maintained. They have self-contained fresh water and self-contained wastewater. But then you're going to have to wrestle with the sanctions camping or the sanctioned congregating. If you want to move the Girton Park, you're not going to want to put a toilet trailer there. So you've got this kind of chasing your tail with unresolved issues that have been unresolved for over a year. But now is the time to think about those because there is going to be leftover CRF funds. And if, if the monies are committed before December 20th or December 30th to purchase uh, a shower trailer or more than one and or same with toilet trailers. Those are legitimate long-term useful uh, investments that can be relocated to another place of higher need or a disaster zone uh, once we do get permanent bathrooms built. But we need to be thinking about and putting a plan together now. So the this, this has been on the list of the charge for the homelessness task force for over a year, and it has not been done until now. So that's an example. Let's not wait for, but just as an example, you go to Shaw's, bathroom closed. You go to Abishan's, not even customers could, uh, customers could use that. Capital Copy, same way. You know, Rapple Rouser, same way. You, you've basically got a serious problem for tourists that I talk to and ask me where to go. And, and the joke on the street is that, oh, the new wayfinding signs will point the way to all the non-restrooms, you know? So uh, let's get serious about this. Thanks. Thank you, Stephen. Um, all right, Jack, and then um, Morgan, do you want to say something about this? I, I was... The reason I was on was just to say that Morgan contacted me and he wanted to get on to, so I wanted to make sure we didn't close it out before he had a chance. Fair enough, no worries. Yes. Uh, Morgan, go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor, and thank you, Jack. I appreciate it. So if you will indulge me a bit, I'd like to speak about public restrooms and the need for access to them and also what Steve Whitaker was talking about with needing to be able to, you know, the proper, having access to proper hygiene and being able to wash one's hands and stuff and how brutal it can be in the winter uh, period. But then, you know, needing to relieve oneself. And I don't know if any of you have ever lived homeless. Mm -hmm without permanent housing, but I have three years. 
including the last 12 years during the, excuse me, during the last go around. And, you know, I remember having to walk the streets during the winter because I didn't have a place anywhere to rest and be. And sometimes, yeah, I went over to Champlain Farms and paid rent for a cup of coffee, you know, to be able to sit there for a little bit. And they don't always let you for very long if they know you, you know, living homeless. And then you leave the place. And with me, with coffee, it goes right through me and I gotta go to the bathroom. Where do I go? And think, please, what if it was you? What if it was one of your family? Or your neighbor, anybody can, pretty much anybody can end up living the whole month. You know, there's a lot of concern about the tourists and stuff, but what about people without anything? Think about it, please. You can see the pain. I mean, right now, just we lived it. It was real hard. Please do something. This is just awful, you know, for people, whether it's during the daytime or the nighttime. And I know I lived through it. And thank goodness and all those people who helped me get housed. I'm still hurting from those experiences. And, you know, People need more than talk. They need more than good intentions. They need something meaningful. And you have the power. You have the duty representing our city to do something about it. You know, they're citizens too. Please, please do something. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan, for thank you, Morgan, for sharing your uh, experience. And um, you know, we certainly we hear you, and we'll um, certainly have to uh, take it in, all into consideration. Um, I mean, there's uh, I'm grateful that we're that we've collected the information that we have so far about the options that are available and. Um, you know, we'll be considering uh, how to move forward. So I'm grateful that you were able to um, jump into the conversation. Just, just keep and, in mind, it's already cold out there. You yeah. know, we're in the daytime and then at night, you know, you got people sleeping out there. Maybe they're fortunate enough to manage. I mean, me, yet, when I didn't have any place of culture for stay. You know, I was walking the streets, literally. I sit in that darn little bus stop that used to be on Taylor Street and sit there, hope the cops didn't come by or nothing. You know, it's like just winter's coming up, you know, and it's already cold at night. And, you know, just people, they, they need some place, okay? And I'd rather have people housed. You know, I'm, a, I'm for... You know, getting people housed, permanent housing, that's what, you know, does the trick. I know, you know, I've been yeah. housed since well, and I'm also, 2009. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm also so glad that um, sounds like the permitting is moving forward for the warming shelter at uh, Christchurch. I think that's really encouraging as well. Yeah, but that, yeah. that's where they've trimmed it down to eight people, as I understand it, you know. Yeah. Keep in mind, keep in mind that the need is greater than that. And so we have to do something. And, you know, you want to do something meaningful, you know, we need to invest in permanent, safe, affordable housing, particularly for those most in need and, and the other things that are needed to um, help people get housed. Yeah. You know, it's just essential. It's important. We need to do. We don't need to talk. We need to do. 
we have to help people. You know, we don't need people suffering and getting ill and dying on the streets. You know, do you want that? Really? I mean, seriously, ask yourself, do you want somebody to end up in the hospital or some institution or dead? Because that could happen, okay, if we don't deal with this stuff. Really, you know. And remember, COVID-19, you know, just and then the flu season, you know, just comp compounds this. So, you know, I I want to second everything that Steve Whitaker said, because I support his efforts along these lines. And I just, and I also want to give a hat tip to Cameron. Cameron, you did really good, and thank you. Thanks, Morgan. With that, that I'll shut up. <laughs> Thank you, Morgan. Uh, okay. So, Council, I just want to say thank you, and also I will continue to work on getting signs. I thought that was a thank you for that feedback um, and just expanding what we have going on right now, our network of what we've already started. And then I will come back with, um, like, we, we will be looking for grant proposals that fit this project. Okay, all right, thank you. So we're gonna move on. Um, I know it's, I recognize it's 10.30. Um, hopefully we're doing okay here still team. Um, I, we have to talk about Halloween, it is coming up. Um, so let's just, we're gonna jump right into that. Um, and I assume that's also Cameron. It is. Okay. I will very, very quickly go through my full like memo, but I will very brief highlight since it is available to folks. Um, I think it is important to uh, call out that there has been an outbreak in Montpelier. There has been uh, at least 12 new COVID-19 cases um, in folks associated with both youth league and adult players in the hockey arena. Um, so. I just want to sort of reiterate how important it is for us to continue wearing masks and following guidelines. Um, travel impacts have also been pretty huge in the last few weeks. The number of travelers who can come to Vermont has fallen almost, almost 3 million since last time I updated you. It's only at 1.8 million folks that can travel in our area at this point, which is a huge drop from like the 4.8 it was last time I talked to you. Um, the state did tell us that they will be letting us know about winter sports by the end of October, which may impact some rec uh, uh, programs. Um, uh, there is a simpler PPP forgiveness for $50,000 loans or less through the U.S. Small Business Administration. Um, so there is a loan forgiveness application that's like really pared down and easy for folks to, um, there's a very low barrier on how to get that. So. That is also important to call out. Um, uh, also, you can see it's behind me. We have opened City Hall successfully on Wednesdays for people who want to come here and participate via Zoom. Um, I'm seated in where the public would be um, if they want to participate in the Zoom meeting and have comments with you face to face. Um, so that went well. We'll consider tonight a trial run and people may be here next meeting. Um, we are opening up our recreation department, uh, the building itself, the rec building for rentals uh, on a limited basis with a lot of guidelines. So um, just letting you know that we are taking that step. And then um, I did want to call out um, that another way is looking for donations um, in the form of tarps, tents, sleeping bag bags, and backpacks and anything kind of related to that, but they are not accepting clothing. So I just wanted to call that out before I jump into Halloween, but that's my general updates uh, for COVID. Regarding Halloween, it's our recommendation that each resident's family review CDC guidelines regarding Halloween to assess the risk level of Halloween activities that they want to participate in. Um, if residents plan on either collecting or handing out candy, the CDC recommends adopting a one-way trick-or-treating method, uh, which they still consider a moderate risk for families. Uh, this sort of means that uh, families would put out individually wrapped goodie bags 
or treats that are lined up for folks to grab uh, while continuing to social distance. So their example was putting bags of candy at the end of your driveway for people to pick up on their way around a neighborhood. Again, they still consider that moderate risk, but that is way less risk than traditional methods of trick or treating or like trunk or treats, which they also list as high risk activities that should be avoided. They also called out um, avoiding events like indoor parties, haunted houses, hay rides, and traveling to other communities. We as the city are not hosting any traditional Halloween related events. Our fire department will not be handing out candy. And um, in general, that's what the state is espousing as well, is following those CDC safety guidelines. And so that is what we've traditionally been following for COVID-19, and that's our recommendations. Also at this point, I don't know of any street closure requests, nor are we closing any streets for Halloween. Just to add to that, um, Montpelier Alive and the downtown are not doing their traditional downtown, you know, trick or treat. I will say, you know, Cameron and I spent a lot of time talking about this and, and, and our position has been from the beginning, and I think you've somewhat adopted this, that we, the city, are not public health experts. We don't have the capacity to, to make these kind of determinations. So we have been deferring to the state and the CDC um, to provide these guidelines. And I think that really is, remains our, our position. But I, I, will, I will say, and, and I haven't had this conversation with Cameron, but the last few days I've gotten a lot of sort of requests like, what's the city gonna tell us to do? And, and I think people are expecting us to say something. Uh, and I think, you know, I've always said, hey, it's, you know, the state and the state has really not said much about, about anything about it. I just said, well, practice, you know, have good practices. So I don't want to have a long conversation here necessarily or put people on but I, I wonder if we shouldn't say, you know, something to the extent that we're not public health experts. These are the guidelines. We, if people are going to do this, but we'd urge people to exercise extreme caution and make your own personal decision about whether you're going to participate in this. I mean, I, you know, it was up to me personally, just based on my own hunch, I'd say don't do it. But I don't have any expertise that says that. I don't have any knowledge. I don't have any, you know, science behind it. Um, so, and, I, and it's not a regular activity, right? We can't tell people they can't walk up and down a sidewalk and knock on somebody's door. <laughs> And, it, you know, it's not a city-sponsored event, per se. So I think, but I do think people are looking to city leadership to provide some sort of statement, some sort of comment or tone. So with that, I'll be quiet. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Is it worth uh, putting out a press release just saying basically what you just said, Bill? It's a, I know it's a press dropped off the call there, but I think that's good, like, common sense. And, you know, I, I don't think the state is going to put anything out, so... Um, I think it might just be worth circulating to our press. That makes sense to me. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, I think you also could refer them to the Vermont Health Department. I mean, they have a little section on Halloween. Yeah, it mostly echoes exactly what the CDC says. Yes, but I mean, if they wanted something for Vermont directly related, yes. I think that's the way to do it. Refer them to the experts. How do you all... Feel, uh, uh, Dan and then Jay. Sure. I, I mean, I, what, I, what I'm hearing from from Bill and from from others is basically, you know, some some clear message that any city or Montpelier Alive sponsored activity is not going to happen. There's not going to be street closures. There's not going to be fires. Department candy handout. There's not going to be a downtown. Um, and that what what remains then is if individual citizens wish to do Halloween, we would recommend that they follow both the state and CDC, CDC public health guidelines, which which clearly do not um, recommend people physically hand out candy, but have have prepackaged candy available for a non person to person handoff, right? And I think we want to be careful about so this again, this is, you know, I'm not a public health person, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm going to play both and say um, that, you know, we want to be careful by, I mean, if we say it's okay in any way, shape, or form, and then there's a breakout, 
Yeah. You know, it was like, well, the city said it was okay. I mean, I think uh, I'd rather us be on the side of caution and saying, you yeah, know, we're not so sure this is a great idea. It's really up to you. We're not doing anything about it. Here's the guidelines that the state and feds have said. Right. You're on your own. All the guidelines are about assessing your own risk. And yeah. even this sort of like a bridge trick or treating is medium risk. And so the recommended up like activities from the CDC and the state are just stay home and do fun Halloween things at home. You know, so I'm gonna jump in line here and say, I mean, we did just have 12 cases in Montpelier. I think it's okay for us potentially to say that publicly, perhaps in a press release, that we recommend that you don't go trick-or-treating, that we want to minimize the risk for Montpelier. Um, we cannot forbid you <laughs> from doing it, but we're going to recommend that you don't. And uh, this is a year to celebrate at home. Uh, I'm just going to say that I'm, I'm seeing a bunch of head nods and some thumbs up. Um, yeah, so, uh, but I also jumped the gun here. So, uh, Jay and then Lauren. Um, I'll just, uh, uh, two things. Uh, one is um, for, the, for those of us who may, who have kids in the school district uh, or may have seen, we, we uh, all got an email from the superintendent right before the meeting started that said that there was uh, a positive test in the school district. So uh, yet another reason um, to, to encourage uh, overly safe behavior. But then the, the other piece of that, more related to Halloween too, is I think that it's worth mentioning, um, not that it necessarily needs to be part of the press release, um, is that I've been in touch with a lot of the folks up on College Street. And for the most part, all, if most, if not all, will not be participating in handing out candy. And, and I think, you know, we, we know that in terms of large gatherings, besides what happens downtown, which is not happening, that tends to be, you know, a significant, you know, a huge gathering, um, gathering point on Halloween. And they've, you know, kind of, you know, it, it's up to individuals, like we said, but the general, the general thinking is that um, they, they will not be participating. And so I will encourage, I, I agree with everything that's been said about uh, the, the city putting out a statement, but then I'll also encourage them to put out on, you know, social media, front porch forum, and let folks know that, you know, they're, that folks who live on College Avenue will not be handing out candy. So don't, you know, please don't show up expecting to, to find it. Yeah, that's fair. I think we could additionally say there are neighborhoods that have already committed to not uh, participate in, in, in Halloween uh, trick or, or trick or treating, really. Um, Lauren, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I just agree with the, the thrust of it. I think clarity on, um, you know, with a really strong statement and I mean, because it is a personal choice, but it affects others. Like I want people knocking on my door. I don't, you know, it's, it does affect other people and then it could, you know, exacerbate this community spread we're already seeing. So I think clear, um, wondering about the CAN network also putting out information through their network. Um, and um, like one other thought that's getting really late. <laughs> Maybe it'll come back to me. Oh, I was thinking um, we could put in that statement like examples of the kinds of things. Like it might have even been in that, that your memo, Cameron, um, of you know, do a scavenger hunt with your own kids around your house, or like there's all these examples out there right now of you know. So try to be like, here are the kinds of safe options that there are. Like make it fun for your kids, but we don't need this unnecessary risk. So that could be another piece. Oh, the last thing, <laughs> sorry. Um, I was wondering too if, if, and I don't know if it would go in a press release or maybe this is something like the city just puts out of like, um, you know, all the money you're gonna save on buying Halloween candy, like, <laughs> consider get contributing to a local Montpelier business or I don't know, something like that. And then at a local business, they need your help. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jack, go ahead. I'm not sure people are stuck are refraining from buying candy, even if they're not going to wind up giving it out to little kids. 
<laughs> but I think this is all. I think this is all good. Tell people not to do it, and and then we'll just eat all the candor ourselves. There you go. With well, yeah. <laughs> Obviously, it's not you know. <laughs> It's otherwise not going anywhere. I'll buy multiple bags of candy for the one or two kids that come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta be prepared. That's right. You never know. Um, okay, so I it I don't. It doesn't seem to me that we need a motion on that. It seems like um, we're all pretty much. Not in clear. Agreement. We'll release a statement in the morning, saying that we recommend that we are not have trick or treat. That there won't be sponsored city activities or support. And you know, if you do it, you're on your own. And here's the CDC guidelines. So you should be arresting people who do it. Yeah. <laughs> right. right. I, okay. Oh, like, sorry. Go ahead, Dan. I was just gonna say I like the idea of sending out a discouraging message, maybe coupling it with the reminder that there are there have been outbreaks, and that the safest behavior is staying home and eating your own giant bag of candy. Um, Is that Dr. Fauci recommended? <laughs> <laughs> OK. I feel like we've got some clarity on that, which is great. Um, and so we're going to move on. Oh, gosh. Got to hold on to all the brain functionality I still have. Um, okay, so we're going to jump into, we're going to do the other business, and then we're going to do um, nominating uh, a representative to the SRO committee, and then we're going to talk about the transit center, and then we're at council reports and we're done. Oh, gosh. Okay. So, um, the Above and Beyond Award. Do you want to do that, Bill? I can do it quickly. Uh, you know, I, I don't believe he's on the call, James. Thing. Um, got the write up. James Richardson. Uh, Richardson, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's late. James Richardson, uh, not Williamson. Um, and he's, you know, DPW folk, and I think the write up explains, but he's really been putting forward. He was nominated by a couple of people, so we're happy to recognize him. Um, this has really been a well received program. You know, we mentioned that um, employees like it, they like nominating other people, they like some really it's really been a good thing. And so that's all. Uh, we don't need to belabor that. If you were here, I'd say more, but thank you, James. Well, for all and please pass along to James our congratulations um, for a job well done. It's always delightful to see uh, who gets nominated for, for these. Very grateful. Can we do like a, maybe a card on this too? Um, I think it might be nice just to pass it around and we can all sign it, um, maybe at the police station. We do the warrant we'll put stuff. that in every time we have one of these. You can expect a card to be put at the police station. That's Thank a great you. idea. It's a really good idea. Cool. Okay. Um, the next uh, part of the other business is uh, relocation of the Gurdon uh, or the, of the pocket of the structure, the pergola um, at the the pocket park. Um, I wonder if I should turn this over to Bill or or I can explain it as well. well. You, can, you know, I mean, we've been talking about this. Um, it's been a challenge and there's been a thought, you know, the new pump track is opening. I think you probably got I forwarded you all an email inviting us to a grand opening next Monday. And the thought is that um, this might be a good place for to use a, a, a nice looking existing structure where people they want to sit and watch their kids ride on the pump track or even rest while they're they're using it uh, and I think the Parks Commission's okay with that I know they are so I think it would provide you know sort of just two issues at once okay um, any thoughts on this Jack go ahead when we discussed this last time um, there is also a suggestion that uh, somebody talk to Paige about uh, her thoughts about moving it. And you know, I, I don't know if that was done. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I did talk to Paige about it. 
and she agrees with me that we should address the underlying problems that, that are causing the uh, attempt to move it. Um, and I also note, just in the way of public comment here, that the since the food meals are, are no longer being distributed there, the litter, they've been making much more of an effort to keep it clean. I've asked both the Public Works and the Parks Department to do one pressure wash through it. Uh, it's been much more orderly. The sculpture has been remounted. So I, I don't, and I know that some of your council members asked that this be discussed. So I think you need to table this for a future meeting. This is not, it seems like you're uh, disregarding the need for it to be discussed and already making plans to have moved it. And it's, it's, it's not proper process. Well, on the agenda for discussion. Okay. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, Donna? Um, I also had a talk with Paige, but she did do a posting on the front porch forum, which made it very clear that she felt it shouldn't be moved, that, as Steve said, the underlying problems should be addressed versus changing the park. But if we are going to move it, I do think the pump station is a good place for it to go and have a good use for uh, people and families around the pump station. I would prefer we try to deal with the problem, but I know it's difficult. Other thoughts on this? Uh, Dan, go ahead. I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate, um, you know, that, and I think we are trying to address some of the underlying problems, but um, I just don't think this is the right place for this particular uh, structure. I think it's, a, it's at a narrow point in the bike path. Um, and I think it just creates flow problems. And I think it would have a much better use up at the pump, pump station. So I would support it being moved. Um, but I don't think moving it is it precludes the idea of addressing the underlying problems and continuing to work on those. I just don't think that this structure at this particular place works. Any other thoughts? I think we've got bigger emergencies on our hands right now to deal with and, and to punish the homeless folks for using that facility. So um, I, I would ask you to table it and take it up once you've got a better sense of what the priorities and what else is neglected and being fallen off the plate right now. Um, so first of all, uh, just one note, Stephen, please do um, wait until you're recognized before you uh, just jump in. Um, second thing, um, seems like there's um, some uh, differing of opinion, which is okay, um, on what to do with this. Any other thoughts from council? Um, and it is okay if you think you would like more time to think about it. Um, Jack and then Jay. I came into this tonight not thinking this would be at all controversial. I, I think it would be appropriate to, uh, to lay it on the table and to uh, consider it at, at another meeting. Okay. Is that, um, there's no urgency to this in terms of timing. Uh, Jay. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I think that there's there's a couple issues here. I think that the structure should be moved, and I think moving it to the pump track makes a lot of sense. I think where it sits now um, doesn't make sense. It, it doesn't work. But seeing how, um, you know, it, it has been used, the idea of just sort of uprooting it without having any um, communication with community outreach, with the homelessness task force, um, and everything that's happening there, any sort of plan, um, it, it feels premature because there, it is not necessarily a time sensitive thing. Um, you know, the, the pump track is, is, you know, just opening on Monday. Um, and, you know, I think that 
you know, we asked city staff to work work with the the with the task force and 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 others to come up with at least a transitional plan. I think um, makes sense. Um, yeah, fair enough. Thank you. Um, and just for for context, I so I've had uh, multiple conversations with uh, folks who hang out there uh, about their thoughts on it moving, and there was a range. I mean, there were folks who were like, <laughs> in all honesty, there were folks that were like, I hope it goes away. And there were folks that were like, I'd be really sad if it moved. Um, and so, you know, as with so many things, there wasn't consensus um, about that. Uh, but I, um, I also think it doesn't hurt to, you know, make a decision at, a, at another meeting and have a little more time for conversation. Um, and that sort of intermediate um, plan. So uh, unless, so it's, um, if someone would like to make a motion, that, that would be okay too. Um, would anyone like to make a motion? Well, um question okay. from the border, I guess, is, uh, you know, if, if the consensus is that we're sort of tabling this to another meeting, mm -hmm. um, is, do we, do we need a motion? Because it's not as if this is an application that we have to move to a date certain, um, you're just looking for. Well, so if my, um, presumption in asking for a motion was if anyone wanted to um, make a decision about it tonight. If you don't, if we, if we want to just put it on, on the next meeting, I don't think we need a motion. We can just put it on the next agenda. Yeah, I, I, I have no need to make this motion or make it happen tonight at least. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll take it up um, at our next meeting then. Um, fair enough. Okay. Oh gosh, we're close team. I'm sorry it's so late. Uh, all right, so nominating someone for the school resource officer. Um, they are looking to have one representative from council serve on this committee to uh, review the SRO position. Um, and is there someone from the council who is interested in being that person? Yeah, go ahead, Jay. Well, yeah, I, I've um, uh, I've had a number of conversations with Jim Murphy about participating, um, being that person. Um, you know, ultimately, um, and Bill, I don't know if you were maybe potentially going to mention this later, but uh, the school board um, turned down our offer to split the fees uh, with uh, with the facilitator. Um, because ultimately they want to be able to own and manage the process, which I think is a, was a good decision. Um, but um, it, Jim was looking, looking to us to, to recommend somebody to, um, to them. To, so they're going to be making all the appointments to the committee, but they were looking to the council to make a recommendation for who we'd like to, to, represent, um, to represent us and, and um, I, I'd be more than happy to. Um, I, I think I'd bring a unique perspective to the SRO position, having been the project manager um, for the playground for a couple of years. I worked directly with Matt. Um, uh, I've also worked, and then the transitioned over to Diane. Um, I also happen to be in a unique position where I have one child in each Montpelier school right now, the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. Um, and so I thought that I could, you know, bring a, you know, the council's perspective, the city's perspective to the conversation, um, as well as, uh, uh, you know, have a unique uh, background and context around what the role of the, the, SR, the role of the SRO plays in schools and, um, and sort of the impact that that position has uh, at, at each of the, the Montpelier schools. So certainly open to, conversation or, if our, or others are interested or have any questions, but I'd be more than happy to represent the council on the committee. Okay, super. Um, other thoughts or comments or other folks who want to uh, 
potentially be that person. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I don't want it. Yay, Jay, I'm glad you volunteered. But I would like us to take it up sometime. So as a council as a whole, could at least discuss a little bit more of our perspective from the SRO. I think that is different than the, than the school. And so my only issue would be I feel that we also need to give Jay support of another point of view than just the school's point of view. Um, and it, it may be worth um, along the way here as you all are meeting um, to give us updates. You know, how, what are you learning? How's the conversation going? Um, that kind of thing. Ab absolutely. And I, just so folks have a sense of what the process will look like, um, it's, it's a fairly accelerated process. The idea is that the, they'll appoint everybody to the committee, at, they being the board, um, at their next meeting, which is a week from, or which is next week. Um, but, uh, and then that, that committee would have until the end of the year to make a recommendation around the SRO position. Um, and then would have, then until, then until March to make broader recommendations around uh, school safety, um, interaction with the police department and with the community, et cetera. Um, it's going to be a fairly, um, it is a fairly aggressive, it is a very aggressive timeline. Um, and as, as the board, as the school board has set it up, there will be 14 people on the committee. Um, so it, I'm thankful that there will be a facilitator. Um, and, uh, I'll, and certainly uh, as we go through that process, which would be a, a few meetings in uh, end of October into November and December, I'll certainly be um, delaying back and reporting back as, as how those converse, conversations go. We need a motion there? Uh, I think that'd be good, yeah. Okay, I'll move to recommend uh, Jay to the SRO task force. Second it. <laughs> okay, any further discussion? I really enjoy this as the second. <laughs> That's great. I hope we do that more of that. Um, okay, so uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> Oh dear. Oh gosh, we're getting punchy. Okay. Will we live, live long and prosper? No. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Jay, for stepping up for that. Very grateful. Um, okay. We are getting there. Um, I know this was not exactly on the list of things that we, that I mentioned earlier, but um, as a part of Kelly's uh, presentation on the budget, uh, she mentioned that we don't have a, or she wanted some clarity on who was on the CIP committee. I thought that we had appointed people to the CIP. So we did. Yeah. We appointed three people to the CIP from, from this group. Apparently the transportation committee would like somebody on, uh, and so the and they've actually named someone. So I think the question is who's actually on this committee who, uh, you know, it's, a, it's a, obviously a committee of the city council, but you can include whoever you choose. So I think Kelly was just like, who's, who's on? <laughs> so. Well, I mean, any member of the public is welcome to attend. Yes. So there's that, but I don't know. Um, Donna, you have a thought? I mean, I don't know. Jack was also at that meeting for the Montpelier Infrastructure Committee. There was a person chosen to represent that committee that wasn't to interfere with the council's representation. They just want to come and participate and be advocating for pedestrians and cyclists. Right. Well, maybe we misunderstood that they were intended supposed to be, you know, a voting member or whatever. I mean, we've never, for, for those that have done it before, we haven't really even had Right, you just talk, you share, yes. I would come up with it, but in the end of the day, it's the three council members on the committee. Right. Yeah, okay. I've to come to a lot of those meetings, and I know I'm no longer a voting member because they're so interesting. So is there anything beyond that that you think that group? Nope. That was it. Oh, okay, great. Uh, any other comments on that? Okay. Uh, great. So... I think we have one more item before council reports. Uh, Donna, transportation um, 
I'm huh. sorry that I missed this when I went through over the weekend. It wasn't until I was reviewing the agenda, this contract for the transit center bill. They have listed like office hours, great office hours, Monday to Friday, eight to six. But then there's all these conditions where they can change it. And then they say that we have a 20% match coming from the city, but they don't put any amount in there, nor do we put any cap in there. So that was a concern. And, uh, it, oh. and the contract is set for a two year term I guess that's safe, uh, and then we evaluate it versus longer or shorter. So those are my three questions. One was, their office hours, is there any way to account to get them to really be staffing that place and have it open? And some yeah. context about our obligated match. So I'll take the first crack. Cameron really handled most of this, uh, so she has the details. So in terms of their office hours, they don't have the money. So the, their funds, as you know, Donna, come really from the state trans money. So they sought to put money, operating cost money, and it didn't get it. So we were in a position of sort of demanding that something be staffed that they couldn't deliver. Uh, so they said, we will make best efforts to staff to these points. Um, you know, I mean, they're willing to do it if we're willing to pay for the staffing. And I didn't, you know, we didn't really think we were in that position. So that was that one. And um, the 20% match, we do have an estimate for that, or ballpark estimate at least. So I'll turn that over to Cameron and also that first one if she has more detail on that. Hey, yes. So um, they didn't put that in because the grant fund is subject to grant availability, but I'll read what they sent to us. Um, the grant for operating costs at MTC is a um, grant for $49,600 with a 20% required local match, which is $9,920. Uh, looking at fiscal year 20, the cost while MTC was open ran about $3,000 a month, but that did not include utility costs, which they are taking ownership of when this operating agreement is signed. That and they're really hoping that they're going to have available funding to be uh, able to cover their fiscal year 21 operating expenses, but they're also approaching VTrans for additional funding. So they're going to let us know if that match goes up in any way, but we don't anticipate it going up, just down. So it does, in the contract, it talks about operating. It's operating just to keep that office open, mm -hmm. and they're estimating 49000 that that's for their operating costs, yes. But that, that includes, but that includes you know, utilities and. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, that's that's good. But then that's supposed to keep it open eight to six yes. Monday to Friday. And depending then, on their staffing ability, yeah. So they they weren't even able to staff it at the beginning. They didn't actually physically get people to apply for that job. Yeah, so that was a huge delay in their opening at all. Well, it's just that you're watching GMT as it, it becomes, as money becomes tight, it's, it's true with their root reductions too, they still have an incredible focus on Chittenden County and Washington County loses. So I, I really want the transit center to be a priority and I'd like us to have some muscle to make them make it a priority. And if we can't do it in the contract, if we're only passive, I, it disappoints me, that's all. But well, maybe we're so we're restricted to some extent, you know, the, the, the transit center was built with primarily uh, federal transit funds. So, you know, basically we have to, we have got to play by their rules. Uh, well, is that what the Montpelier Transportation Commission is? I didn't really see a definition in the contract, but that's the term that's used. I'm not sure what that is. Mont your transportation commission anyway I, I could talk about that I mean if this needs to be approved tonight fine but if it doesn't I would really like to explore some of this but if it my question is is what ex what exactly do you want to see if you if you were proposing changes what were, are those changes that we have some muscle to have it open and staffed so but if they can't hire, if we can't, we can't control if they have funding to staff or if they even have the people to hire. 
Right, but we put this money into the transit center so that it's open, so that it'll work for pedestrian and bike and bus riders. So I, I want them to put their commitment here instead of just all in Chittenden County. Uh, I mean. All right, well, I, you know. And, and if there's no leeway on it, there's no leeway on it. But I'll tell you, in the future, it's, there's going to be a lot more push. If this is this is the style of contract and attitude that's going to come out of it. I mean, we put a lot of money Mayor. in that transit center, and I'm not seeing it paying. It's giving giving to the community as it should at all. Um, hold on a second, Stephen. I think Bill. Has uh, I don't have more to add. I, I, I'm with you. We pushed as hard as we could on you know the bathroom availability and all, and all the other things. Um, and we you know we can take it back to them. I just you know we don't have any control over. I, I may, you know, philosophically, we may agree, yeah, you put more into Chittenden County. I don't know how VTrans assigns those funds. We're, we're not in that loop. We don't have any say over how those funds, you know, what they ask for and what they get. Um, so, if you, I mean, I, I really, if there's suggestions, we're happy to, to take a look at them and, and talk to them about this. In the two-year uh, agreement was because that was their current grant cycle. So um, they couldn't extend beyond. Um, one question, Bill. What is uh, the urgency on this particular contract? Do we need to approve it this evening? Cameron, you want to take that one? I mean, it would be great. We've been at this for a long time, and we've been trying okay. to all, but it's, you know, it's just, yeah. I mean, okay. It's that's that's good school. They have a timeline they're trying to hit. I think this is important for them for their continued funding is having an agreement in place. Okay. Uh, but it, but we have, I mean, to be fair to us, we have been pushing back on this for almost a year now. Uh, we've been working, going back and forth with them and our lawyers and their lawyers since I, since I got here. So um, this is a, a pretty robust um, agreement. So I do agree if you need more time, it, it, it's their timeline, not ours. Okay. And even if we did approve it, it's only two years. Mm -hmm. long, so it could be renegotiated with, within, a, <laughs> relatively speaking, short time. Um, okay. Um, and Stephen, did you want to comment? I do. I, I think that if, if you're going to move forward with it, you insist that provisions be put in there that it can be renegotiated sooner than two years, for, especially for elements of bathroom access. If the city needs to share the staffing, use part of the homelessness task force appropriation and put our own staff in there on certain hours. But do not forfeit those valuable city-owned bathrooms, you know, in, in a pandemic emergency. You know, it's, I don't believe that our staff have been arguing uh, hard enough or have had sufficient direction from council on the urgency of making those bathrooms available uh, to the public. And it's a travesty that it's been closed as long as it has, while the city gives the construction workers keys to go in there and use it while they're, instead of having porta potties for the construction job on Taylor Street. So it, it's been mismanaged and insist that the public access bathrooms be left open if the contract has to be approved it can be negotiated and look for funding uh, from available resources to pay and share the staffing of that facility to keep it open thank you but just for the record so everyone's aware the city did not provide them keys if you, that was an arrangement that was probably made between the contractor and gmt the city wasn't involved in that okay thank you um Okay, so one possibility is that we approve it tonight. Another possibility is that we delay. Um, um, either way, um, is there anyone who'd like to make a motion? Go ahead, Dan. I'll make a motion that we approve the contract with uh, Green Mountain Transportation. Or the Transportation Transit, I always get those backwards. Um, Green Mountain Transit Authority. Green Mountain Transit Authority. Is there a second? 
Okay, <laughs> we have a second from Jack. Um, and any further comments? I'm going to vote against it, so you're going to have to do a roll call. Okay. And it's not, I mean, I totally understand, Cameron. You probably pushed it and pushed it. It's, I just need to vote against it. That's all. <laughs> okay. I will uh, never take personal offense against any of this ever. Thank um, you. Jack, did you have a comment? Yes. The, uh, the only, only question I have is if we, if we don't think there's a, a realistic prob possibility of getting more in this contract than we already have, then I don't see a point to not approving it tonight. So uh, I think Bill and Cameron are probably in the best position to say what, what the prospects are. Yeah, I mean, we wouldn't have brought it to you if we didn't think this was the best we could do. Okay, that's fine with me. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, roll call. Well, I was going to do. <laughs> I warned you. <laughs> uh, well, we can. How about this? Why don't we just start with a roll call? That's that's fine. So, um, uh, Donna. Nay. Connor. Aye. Jay. Aye. Dan. Aye. Jack. Aye. And Lauren. Aye. Okay, so the motion passes. And uh, okay, I think that is the end of our regular business. Whew, okay, council reports. Uh, we're going to go in that order. Uh, Donna. Just asking everybody to be safe. We've got some nasty numbers going on in Vermont. Be safe. That's all. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Connor. Um, 24 hours to fill out the census. Very important. So just a reminder there. And uh, micro transit is plugging away. I know a lot of people in the community have had some concerns. So please get those to, you know, Donna and I are your reps on council here. Uh, or sustainable Montpelier. Just want to emphasize um, there's a do no harm approach. We really want to make sure everybody who rides the circulator bus is taken care of. And even though it's a transition, um, we hope this broadens the level of services. So, you know, if somebody um, up on North Street needs to, you know, use this, they'd be able to. So it's not taking away services, it's actually expanding them, uh, but there'll be some growing pains there. That's it for me. Thank you. Jay. Um, yeah, echoing Donna uh, around folks making sure they're staying safe. Certainly lots of uh, lots of people in town right now um, from all over. So just uh, being extra cautious. Also, uh, just want to acknowledge a uh, huge thanks to John Holler and the folks at Mamba for all their work on the pump track. Excited to see that open and available to, to kids. Um, and then also, uh, it, it's come up it's been alluded to here and there, but a, a huge thanks to everybody involved in Montpelier Live for seeing through all the wayfinding signs. Um, it's been great to see those finally installed um, and looking good uh, around town. So thanks. Great. Dan. Uh, not much other than to say voting is open. And if you haven't made a plan to vote, everyone should be doing that plan and, and voting. And I'm sure John will give us an update on that, but vote, it can't be said enough. I agree. Jack. This is short notice, but uh, for people who have been uh, interested in the issue of, uh, of policing, uh, there is an online event uh, tomorrow, five o'clock to 6.30 p.m. Alternatives to Policing in Vermont Schools, How to Organize for Safer Schools in Your Community, uh, hosted by a uh, half dozen or so nonprofit organizations, including the Human Rights Commission and uh, Vermont Legal Aid. And if people want to see how they can log on to that <clears throat> and register for it, it's on the Vermont Legal Aid 
Facebook page. I also shared it on my own Facebook page. Um, I'll be in another meeting, so I won't be able to be there, but uh, there are, I think most, if not all, the organizations sponsoring this have uh, come out in favor of removing school resource officers. Um, so people who want to get some information about that side of the debate, uh, this might be a good place to go. And that's all I've got. Okay. Uh, Lauren, thank you. I'll pass. Okay. And all the things I was going to say, you all have already said it. So um, I am also going to pass. And so that leads to John. John Odom. Here. Sorry, I always hit the wrong buttons. <laughs> um, you know, I actually feel like I have a, a ton to tell you all, but it's awfully late, so I won't. Um, but I mean, unless you really want to hear details, it's nothing you can't wait. Um, but I would just remind anyone who's listening that you should have received a ballot by now. If you haven't, um, please contact us. I'm sure there's a very good reason, but one way or the other, we'll get it to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Voting uh, is robust. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> as it has one would hope. Uh, Bill. I can't imagine what we would have that would be a value added at 1119. Yes. You know, this is the latest meeting we've had in a long time. And I'm sorry, team. Thank you for hanging in there. I'm trying to not make this normal. Um, Okay, I think that concludes all of our business. Um, thank you, everyone. Have an excellent evening. I, without objection, I'm going to consider this meeting adjourned. Okay. Thanks, Good all. Good evening, guys. Good to see you. See you.